give you courage in doing this. I, I don't think most people realize the kind of um, harassment, threats, horrible things that are said to you and your family because you're doing this. And again, I emphasize, we've let something really go wrong in this country when that happens. Some of you are old enough and some of you are not old enough to remember the McCarthy era. Well, this I call this the McCarthy era on steroids. Um, people being actually fired from their jobs. We had a lawyer who was handling one of our major cases. His very distinguished law firm, can't be really much of a law firm, said that he couldn't remain with his law firm if he represented the President of the United States. If that isn't uh, censorship, if that isn't a form of despotism and, and distortion of the values of our country, I don't know what is. It started before, it's been going on for some time, like um, that kind of despotism and, and, and uh, authoritarianism, it always starts sl slowly. You could see it in things done 10, 12 years ago. I think the pandemic released the tendencies of left-wing, socialist-leaning, socialist governors, congressmen, senators, to move to where socialism always moves to. In the history of socialism, which is an old idea, not a new idea, authoritarianism is always the end result. Because when the government controls property, the government controls. And it doesn't want to. They don't want to be interrupted by the stupid ideas of the dumb people of the country. The elite know better. Boy, doesn't that sound like America today? I mean, that was Russia, that was China, that is China. That was Poland, that was Bulgaria, that was East Berlin. Gosh, I thought we fought that and got rid of it. Never thought I'd see it in America. It's in America. It began, it began with the revelation of the hard drive that proves substantial major crimes on behalf of the Biden family. Censored, not allowed to be shown, not allowed on television, not allowed in the newspapers. Just, we don't want to see the facts, even though they may point out millions and millions of dollars going to a vice president from China, Russia, Ukraine, Romania, oh, I can't remember all the places. Highly unusual for a vice president to become a multimillionaire while he's sitting in the office of vice president. But it happened, and he's the uh, candidate of the Democratic Party right now. That was covered up. As soon as this election moved into the questionable stage, same practice was used. Cover it up, cover it up, cover it up. Big tech, big media, crooked Democratic leaders, big business that profits from the system the way it operates right now. Their desire is to make country not America first, but wherever America should be put so they can make a profit. We could be third, we could be fifth, <laughs> we could be non-existent as long as they're making a profit. They have no sense of how important this country is to the, uh, really, to the, to the survival of the world as a decent place. There is no other country that puts its men and women's lives at risk to save other people. That country doesn't exist on earth. It's us. And if we destroy the essential nature of this country, the world's in for a terrible period of time. Well, specifically to this, this election was the subject of a conspiracy that goes back before the election. A conspiracy that was hatched by the crooked leaders of the Democratic Party. And let me say this to all Democrats. 99% of Democrats are just as honest, just as good, just as decent as Republicans. They may not be as correct on the policies, but we can forgive that. Mm -hmm. Some of my best friends and relatives are Democrats, and they're not correct on the policies. They believe the same thing about me. But they don't cheat, they don't steal votes, they don't sell public office. The very, very top of the Democratic Party has been corrupted badly since Clinton, and it's carrying itself through, and it hasn't been exercised. The head hasn't been cut off yet of that corruption. This, this, this conspiracy is, isn't limited to, but as you hear the testimony, I think you'll figure it out, just like the people in Pennsylvania, and later in the week, the people in Michigan. It centers around the mail-in ballots and the absentee ballots. We've been warned for 20 years that going to major mail-in ballots as a way of doing our elections 
will be fraught with tremendous fraud. They're very dangerous. It's almost impossible for even semi-crooked politicians to resist the temptation to use it for ballot stuffing. We were warned by President Jimmy Carter. We were warned by former Secretary of State Jim Baker in a report, very, very consequential report. They said we should never do it. And if we do it, it should be extremely limited to the real absentee situations like we have done in the past. We were warned by Justice Souter in the Supreme Court, warned by many, many experts, Republican and Democrat. Democrats used to be against mail-in ballots, like they were against everything else until President Trump was for it, which gives you a sense they're not thinking about the country. They're thinking about competitive advantage, getting their power back, serving their greed and for power and money. So when they saw the mail-in ballot situation, they said, wow, we could change an election in the past, like they did in Chicago in 1960 with, with Governor uh, Mayor Daley, like they did in Florida or tried to do just last year in Florida by turning the votes in Broward and Palm Beach County, holding them back for two weeks and seeing if they could get enough absentee ballots made up. They couldn't get there. They couldn't get there because there were only like three or 400,000 absentee ballots. You can't expand it to a million. But when you have 2.5 million mail-in ballots, you can expand it to 3 million or 3.2 million. Or you can count it four or five times in the machine. There's plenty of room for cheating, which is why they slowed it down. So you're, you're in it with other states. It's not just Arizona that has been conned and the people of Arizona taken advantage of and their right to vote taken away from them. It's the people of Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Nevada, Georgia, and Arizona that we know of. And if your right to vote has been taken away, so is mine. We have an illegitimate election. We have demonstrably wrong numbers in those states. <laughs> in your state, a lot of the fraud had to do with the mail-in system as it did in other places. Your state's a little bit different than Michigan and Pennsylvania. Your state, it wasn't full and complete shut out of all Republicans in seeing mail-in ballots and ballots that were in dispute. But it was significant. A significant number of these witnesses were shut out when the important determination was being made, is this ballot valid or isn't it? When you make that determination, as a matter of law in almost every state in the country, and just as a matter of due process and fairness, we'd all agree both parties should get to see it. That's the last time you get to check the validity of the ballot. That's why mail-in ballots are different. We can go back to the machines and we can study the machines. Maybe we can pick up the fraud and the, and the evidence of it because there's, there's traces left in it. But once the envelope is separated from the ballot, gone forever, you will never know how to connect the fraud which is why President Carter and Jimmy Baker said it's a field day for fraud. The way you accomplish the fraud is you don't have an independent party or a Republican, if you're going to cheat the Republicans, you don't have him in the room so he can object to it and point it out. Look, there's, this, is the same, this is the same handwriting on 12 ballots. Oh, they, they, they didn't fill out the envelope. They just filled out the ballot. Or... This, this, this seems like it was done by a machine. Those are the things you can object to. So in probably at least 100,000 situations in Maricopa County alone and Pima, you did not have the opportunity to do that. Those votes should be declared null and void. You also, in addition, however, had your own variations, as the other states did. So the key, the key fraud is the mail-in ballot. That was the backup in case they fell too far behind. That's why they cut off the vote at midnight, one o'clock, when President Trump was getting too far ahead, particularly in Pennsylvania, in uh, Michigan, in uh, Wisconsin, and, and also in um, uh, Pennsylvania. So they cut off the vote. He was getting up to 800,000 in Pennsylvania, 300,000 in Michigan. He was even further ahead in Wisconsin. They cut off the vote. 
They turned things off, they chased everybody out, and then it's not your concern, except for the fact that you got to look at, look at this somewhat in to total. They started bringing in false ballots. We have three witnesses to 100,000 of those ballots being brought in at 4.30 in the morning in Detroit with no Republicans around that they knew of. Luckily, we had two that stayed behind and a Dominion employee who was willing to be honest. Not all of them are honest. So the point of that is you're part of this fraud. You also had numerous situations of your workers, your citizens observing the poll officials helping people vote to the point of telling them who to vote for. Clear fraud. You have situations of uh, poll workers being observed changing votes, taking ambiguous votes and making sure they were cast for Biden. And you have situations of stuffing the ballot box. And we'll, we will try to quantify those. Those are harder to quantify. But the ones involving the exclusion of observers are quantifiable, and that's 100,000. So let me spend just one minute, and then we'll get our witnesses out, on Dominion. Dominion is a foreign company. It's, it's a Canadian company. It has an office in America, but it's a foreign company. Question number one. I have to believe the people of Arizona had no idea a foreign company was counting their vote. I guarantee you they didn't, because the people in New York did. I didn't. I find that outrageous. We, we can't get an American company that we have complete jurisdiction over to count our votes. Now, did we pick this company here in Arizona without any due diligence? It's not just a foreign company. It's a foreign company that's been in a lot of trouble. In Texas, it was excluded after two years of study for being exceedingly incompetent. It screwed up elections in the past. It's well known for having the most porous system of all the companies, meaning it's the easiest one to penetrate. They do little or nothing to protect against hacking. They even explain to some extent in their manual how to get into them, how to, how to manipulate them. And then they have a history going back to the Smartmatic company that actually was formed for the purpose of fixing elections. I don't know if this, I don't know who makes the choice in your state of who should be counting your votes, but I know that person either is exceedingly naive or work much worse. If, if, this, if this wasn't known to the person making the choice, then you gotta change your whole system. Finally, you don't have to wait to change your system. We don't have to endure a phony election and the biggest voter fraud in our history and end up with a tainted election and go down in history as a country that didn't have the courage to deal with it, go down as the first group of Americans that didn't have the courage to stand up when their freedoms were being taken away. We'd be the first. When I, when I see some of these leaders cower at the idea of, of doing what the Constitution gives them the power to do, I become very discouraged about can we really stand up to this invasion on our, what's been really an invasion on our freedom of religion, our freedom of speech, and now our, 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 our right to a fair and honest count, that's all we want. I mean, the one thing you will come away with here is the vote as it presently exists is false. It's fraudulent. If they certify it, they are certifying a false statement to the United States of America. Gosh, when I was a prosecutor, that was a federal crime. False statement to the United States in probably the most important matter we have, the selection of our commander in chief. I mean, I, I can tell you where the false statements and where the numbers end up, but that doesn't even matter. It is clear that the numbers are false. It's clear that you, are, you have included ballots that weren't properly inspected. It's clear that you're including ballots that were voted by other people. It's clear that you're using machines that have been shown to be totally manipulated in other places and you won't give us the opportunity to examine those machines. I think anybody who, who, who puts their name on that is getting very close to committing a crime. 
And I think anyone who stands by and lets it happen, maybe they're not committing a crime, but they've lost the sense of what it means that we have to fight to protect our values and our rights. Because there are always people, both externally and internally, who want to take them away. And I'm going to ask you to fight. And I'm going to ask you to try to implore the other members of your legislature to stand up to this. Do not be bullied. Do not be frightened. Your political career is worth losing if you can save the right to vote in America. In fact, I may get you a... In fact, I can get you a chapter in Profiles in Courage if you do that. Because at times in our history, certain men and women have stepped forward and lost their political career to give us the rights that we have. It's very, very, very similar to losing your life on the battlefield. But that's really what's required right now. Under the Constitution, and we are going to give all of you the memorandum from Professor Eastman, very short and very direct, and you can just go to the third page, it makes it very clear that under Article 2, Section 1, Clause 2, of the document that guides us, we're not guided by your governor, we're not guided by your Secretary of State, we're not guided by Joe Biden, we're not guided by the New York Times, and we're not guided by all those stations that call the election. You know what we're guided by? The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States says that you, the legislature of Arizona, have the plenary power to regulate the selection of electors in a presidential election. The Supreme Court, in a case that you will see cited there in McPherson, has already answered the question that many ignorant talking heads, who really shouldn't be representing anyone because they're incompetent, on television they say, well, you, 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 can't, uh, you can't change it retrospectively. You can only change it prospectively. Now, I doubt whether they know the difference between retrospectively and prospectively, <laughs> but I don't want to be mean. Ha. <laughs> the United States Supreme Court, I think it's in 1892, said, you can change it at any time. It's your constitutional power, solely. You don't share it with anybody. That clause doesn't say Congress, it doesn't say governor, it doesn't say newspapers, it says the state legislature. And the Supreme Court has said, you can change that and take that power back anytime you want to, because it's your power, it's not theirs. Whatever power the governor or the secretary of state thinks they're exercising, it isn't theirs, it's the legislature's. You can take it back. already decided by the Supreme Court. And then uh, based on evidence, not whim, not political bias, not fear of the media, based on evidence, you can make the determination. What is the right count? Well, how can we get as close to the right count as possible? If we can, then have the courage to select that person to get the electors, because that person won the honest vote. And every dishonest vote disenfranchises the decent people who cast an honest vote. Have the courage to do that. In history, I swear to God, you will be heroes. To half the half this... <laughs> if you can't, if you can't make a determination, then don't certify. That's happened before. If, it's to, if they have screwed this up so badly, that you really can't make a determination, then the answer is you do not certify. You, you can't honestly put your name on a document that sends them the right result. As decent, honest people, that's what you should do. I, I, I know I will probably, this is probably the wrong tactic, but we're down near the end. I don't see how any decent, honest person could let this happen. I do not see how any decent, <laughs> honest person could let this happen. So, with that, I just tell you that the, 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 the characteristic of human beings that I admire the most, 
because my heroes are, are uh, Churchill, Reagan, who's the only president I work for, my hero, mm -hmm. and now our new president, who's been my friend for 30 years, and I always knew he'd be a good president, didn't know he'd be a great president. Mm. And that's the reason they want him out so badly, because he threatens them with destroying the corrupt system they have been enjoying in Washington since Bill Clinton got there. So, our first witness, Phil, are you ready? Oh, yes, why don't we, what, do you want to explain this to them? Jenna will explain this to you. And good morning. Uh, thank you so much to the panel uh, and the Arizona legislature for having us today. This is incredibly important, and uh, I, I can't underscore enough what the mayor has presented today about the opportunity that you all have to make sure that you use the constitutional provisions that our founders so keenly foresaw would be necessary for today. And this document that we want to present to you uh, is called the Constitutional Authority of the State Legislatures to Choose Electors. We will present to you the facts, the evidence, and the witnesses so that you can make that determination. But we want you to have the research from someone else who is a constitutional law expert so that you can hear from someone else besides us that is also affirming the argument that we make today. And this document is very short, but it talks about the McPherson versus Blacker case, which uh, for reporters, I would encourage you all to look it up and maybe write some articles about it. It's 146 US 1, and if you look at page 35, this was an, an 1892 case. And it says, uh, nonetheless, the constitutional power to decide on the method for choosing electors remains exclusively with state legislatures. The Supreme Court has described the constitutional authority of the state legislatures to determine the manner of choosing electors as plenary. It has even noted that whatever provisions may be made by statute or by the state constitution to choose electors by the people, there is no doubt of the right of the legislature to resume that power at any time. And after you hear the facts and the evidence today, and we will give you this document to read, to be able to cite and to uh, draw firm grounding on your Article 2, Section 1.2 authority, we are going to ask you as legislators to reclaim that authority and to make sure that the people of Arizona and indeed the people of the United States of America as a whole are not disenfranchised by corruption. Federalist 68, uh, Alexander Hamilton talks about the method of choosing our chief magistrate, our president of the United States, and that this safeguard of vesting that authority exclusively with the state legislatures is the safeguard to making sure that corruption does not win. And when the vote of the people and the voice of the people is corrupted through influence, through fraud, then it is the responsibility, the duty, and the obligation, not just the choice, but the actual duty and obligation of the legislature to step in and to make sure that you don't certify false results. You are the last step to make sure that this election is not corrupted. And again, we aren't asking you to step in and overturn an election. We are asking you to step in to make sure that the corruption that occurred here does not stand. And this is exactly why you are on the front lines. So with your permission, Mr. Chairman, I'll approach and get these Yes, two. thank you, Ms. Ellis, please. Thank you. Mr. Giuliani, are you ready for uh, Colonel Waldron? Colonel Waldron is, is, our, Waldron is our first witness. And um, I'll ask him a few questions and then he'll, and then he will make his own presentation. And then, of course, you, perfectly free to ask him any questions that you want. Uh, Colonel uh, Waldron, did you, um, did you have the opportunity to examine uh, any of the Dominion machines that were used in this election? Uh, yes, sir. Our team uh, looked at some uh, machines and software up in Michigan. So 
You know that Dominion machines were used in Maricopa County to count the vote. Correct. And they were also used in Michigan. Michigan, Georgia, Pennsylvania. And the machines, that, the machines that you observed, took a look at, were able to examine, were used in the Michigan vote? Correct. Now tell us a little about Dominion. Dominion is a, is a company that makes uh, voting machines and voting calculation machines? That's correct. They've got uh, full end-to-end -end, uh, election you know, equipment and software. And uh, the actual software in the Dominion machine, is that Dominion software or is it someone else's? Uh, Dominion is more of a hybrid. Uh, they, over the years, they've acquired uh, other voting companies, um, Sequoia and Premier. Uh, Sequoia was spun off of uh, SGO, and uh, Premier was spun off of uh, Diebold as a result of the uh, antitrust lawsuit. Sequoia is the company that was uh, involved in the very serious um, uh, miscalculation of the Chicago vote in 2007, wasn't it? I believe that's correct, yes sir. And they were using Smartmatic uh, software, right? Correct. And they're, the software, the, the, the licensing agreements are uh, pretty well, uh, it, it's, a, it's a good spider chart for all of these companies. They all share a common DNA in the, the software code. And that company, Smartmatic, their, their roots are in Venezuela, isn't that right? Yes sir, uh, Hugo Chavez was one of the, one of the founders and uh, invested, I think, 28% ownership in the, the initial setup of, uh, of the, uh, the SGO election systems. And they have been involved in several South American elections that were fixed, altered? Argentina, Bolivia, Singapore, Venezuela, Italy, several. And just, just to simplify things, and we can make this available to you, and uh, we've we have several witnesses that go back to that period of time who were involved in the vote fixing, who have looked at the vote pattern in Arizona and elsewhere, and said that the pattern matches the way in which Dominion and Smartmatic, companies like that, fix votes. Isn't that right? Yes, sir. And uh, what did you, uh, what, what did you, well, let me ask you this other question. Uh, one of the former officials of the United States government, a gentleman named Chris Krebs, the former DHS official, uh, shortly after the election, he made an announcement that many of these people refusing to take a look at any evidence are relying on. Well, what did he say? Um, Mr. Krebs uh, was the director of uh, CISA D at DHS, and uh, he basically said that this election was the most secure in history. The most what? Most secure. In the history. most secure in history. And partially that was because the states uh, do a, uh, an excellent job of validating voter rolls and that this equipment is not connected to the Internet. That was in his... Uh, this, he said this, uh, uh, this is not this equipment which was largely Dominion and several others, is not connected to the internet. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Now, is Dominion on his council? Uh, Dominion is, uh, was on uh, Mr. Krebs' election security advisory council. <laughs> and, and is there, and we'll get to it with <coughs> witness it, is there substantial evidence, not only here in Arizona, but in other, other states like what we presented in Pennsylvania, that Dominion was in fact connected to the internet. Uh, are, you, are you referring to information other than the user's manual? <laughs> well, let's go back to the user's manual. Tell them about the user's manual. Uh, the the uh, Dominion Suite user's manual is, is about an inch and a half thick. Um, and uh, my, my team went back to the user's manual and looked at uh, all the instances where uh, in the user's manual uh, it tells operators to connect the ethernet cords to the router uh, and, and it is, uh, the systems are connected to the internet. And then uh, what evidence do you have that there actually was connection to the internet? Uh, our teams looked at uh, spider graphs of the Dominion network uh, on election day 
and showed the, the increased uh, web traffic, internet traffic on election day for Dominion servers. So on, on election day, Dominion was communicating by internet. Correct. Contrary to what Mr. Krebs said or thought. <coughs> that, that is correct. And tell us now, what, um, what's the, what, how, how, how do they, take us through how the vote can be modified. And then take us through <coughs> what you saw in the machine in uh, Michigan where they did actually modify the vote. So uh, um, my background uh, in the military, I uh, started off my career as an air cavalry officer, um, flying helicopters, counter reconnaissance, reconnaissance, um, moved uh, later into information warfare as an as a information operations officer, uh, running uh, uh, psychological operations, computer network operations, <coughs> um, deception, operation security, and electronic warfare, special electronic warfare. And um, our team has been researching this specific issue since August of this year. Um, we are working with another team that's been uh, intently working on this voting machine manipulation for about two years uh, when it became apparent in the uh, Ted Cruz and Beto race in 2018, as well as the, uh, the Kentucky governor's race with, with Matt Bevins. Um, we saw significant anomalies in those races, and that's kind of the experience or our, our background working with this system. And I, I would tell you as, a, uh, as an unconventional warfare uh, information operations, information warfare specialist, uh, the American populace is facing uh, an unconventional uh, warfare scenario, and this, this, is, this is information warfare. Um, the voting systems in the U.S. and uh, Arizona, Dominion, and several of the other machines were built to be manipulated. Uh, and, it, and as the mayor said, they've been used in elections uh, around the world with uh, questionable results. And uh, we believe that uh, these, these same questionable results are present in, in this election. Um, again, my, my background as um, an information warfare officer is how to get in and corrupt these machines to conduct strategic influence operations. How do I, how do I get, get the enemy or, or target population in a foreign country to um, think and act a certain way? Um, these machines have multiple uh, points of injection that are um, vulnerable, everywhere from the server level, where um, passwords, accesses are posted for the dark web for any hacker to, to get in and access them. And what they can do at the far, far right limit is download CSV files or like an Excel spreadsheet, change the columns, and re-upload them. And uh, that, that can be done at the server level. At the operator level, if there's software, it can be corrupted. It can be manipulated. With a device that's as small and as simple as a USB device, which these machines are, are booted up and run off of. So. Um, the, the, the little bit of history, and I can show you some uh, some charts on on the DNA of these machines. But the common uh, the common software goes back to SGO SGO Smartmatic. Um, as Mayor mentioned, uh, they sold uh, Sequoia voting systems to Dominion in 2010, and then Diebold spun off the Premier Election System to Dominion as a result of the antitrust concerns. I believe that was also in 2010. So the bottom line is that these systems all have similar code and similar functions, and it's displayed in their operator's manual. So, um, it, you know, I know it's kind of been, uh, you know, in the, in the press, it's kind of been poo-pooed that, uh, oh, this doesn't go back to Hugo Chavez. Um, but I, I personally debriefed the son of a Cuban intelligence officer uh, who had firsthand knowledge speaking with um, two of Hugo Chavez's <coughs> uh, family members that, um, in the Maduro election, when the populist uprising threatened uh, Venezuela's uh, totalitarian leadership, uh, that uh, Hugo's, uh, Hugo Chavez's family members said that, don't worry, that it's guaranteed that their father invested the money to build the SGO uh, voting machines system. So in a nutshell, these systems are not what you've been told, if you've been told anything. They are connected to the internet. There is no transparency of how the voter information is processed <coughs> and stored. 
And as a matter of fact, these companies have refused to, to allow any type of inspection uh, into their code, and they, they always decry, uh, you know, it's, it's our IP, it's IP protection. Um, but with uh, the declaration, I believe, with uh, Jay Johnson, who was uh, our Secretary of Homeland uh, Security, uh, he declared that uh, the national um, election system was national critical infrastructure. So there is, you know, uh, I think reason to for uh, you know for us to understand the code and how these machines function and how they use our uh, our votes and process our votes. The um, the voting record is able to be modified, deleted, adjusted by administrators or outside threats, and those are, those are also explained in the, in the user's manual. Operators can assign votes for write-in votes blank or error ballots in large numbers. So all of these votes, they could get put into a batch file, and then the administrator of that voting or tabulation system can say, okay, there's, there's 8,000 votes in this batch file, or there's 5,000 votes in this batch file, and they can say, well, I think, you know, this batch will just make this go to this candidate. And, and they, they have that in, in, they have that authority in the user's manual to do that. Um, our team is not the only team that's working on this. There are literally hundreds of other small cyber teams that uh, have weighed in on this. Uh, there are tons of statisticians. Some of you'll hear from your some of your uh, your Arizona citizens today. Uh, but we've been working in several states looking at at these anomalies. Um, but it's it's not a secret. Uh, I mean, DefCon last year, I think the hacking teams broke in and manipulated these machines in under two minutes. So it can be done, it's easy, and, and there are very little security. Too so uh, they can be hacked to manipulate votes. Um, one of our white hat hackers uh, discovered a malware on the server, uh, that's called the QSnatch, that basically records um, login credentials and passwords. So if someone in, uh, in Philadelphia or someone in Maricopa County or someone in, in uh, Antrim, Michigan logged in, that malware will grab their username and password. And so you can log in. If you got access to the, the, the backside of that malware, you can log in wherever you are in the world to Maricopa County to manipulate. Um, so Colonel, there, there's multiple Colonel, Colonel, ways. Just interrupt your second, yes, so, sir. So we get the uh, point of this clear. You actually examined one of the machines, and you were actually able to see very, very uh, clear changes in vote in the machine, correct? Correct, in uh, Michigan. How, and it was down ballot changes. How, how many? Correct. Um, so the, the down ballot um, looks, it was for, there were, there were changes in the election day vote on 11-3 on to the recount vote on 11-6. Uh, say, for example, uh, the school board, one lady on the election day received 519 votes, and this was a very small uh, precinct. Uh, and the, the post recount, uh, they went from 592 to 852. The total votes went from 1068 to 1810, and the write-in vote jumped uh, from 24 to, to 112. There was another um, proposition on a state proposal that um, jumped significantly from, from 700 votes on election day up to 1083 uh, on, on the recount. So there, there are a lot of variabilities and what we believe this is due to is the, the USB drive that was used in the election day versus the post-election uh, post recount. Well, th this, this uh, proposition, when I see, uh, I think we should give them a copy of this, make this available to them because it shows on the day of the election, this, this is a proposition about the use of future revenues generated from oil and gas bonuses. And I take it it was fairly controversial. So the first vote was 774 for, 508 against. The second vote was 1083 for, and 206 against. Quite a difference. Now, how did that difference come about? How do, how do you accomplish that difference? How, how does the machine change from after the votes are cast? What does the machine remember other votes? 
So there's a there's a, a card that stores the votes and it's run against the algorithm that's put on the USB card into the actual machine and the in the tabulator. And that difference was was basically the, the tabulation algorithm. Why excuse me for my ignorance, but why would you put an algorithm in if you have a vote that's seven seventy four to five oh eight? That's uh why wouldn't you just look and see was that the correct vote? Why do you put an algorithm in, which is introducing an outside force to what should be an internal process? To shift things how you, how you like them. Uh, when, you, when you look at moving these algorithms around through the different precincts, <coughs> um, you, can, you can achieve quite a number of aggregate ballot shifts. So this is this was one instance and one recount and one small. So instance. when they looked when they looked at the machine on election day, it was 774 to 508. When they looked at it again on the recount three days later, it was 1,083 to 206. Is that right? Correct. And that happens because of an algorithm, not because anybody changed their vote. The uh, the the. Elections clerk uh, did write an affidavit, and they basically said that we followed all the procedures on election day, as well as a recount, and uh, these were the results that the election clerk. We're also going to submit recount. this study. It's quite complicated. I fell asleep last night reading it, and had uh, dreams about internet surveillance and all kinds of things. I propose getting an expert to look it over. But it shows what exactly what the colonel is saying, that these machines should not be voting machines because anybody can communicate. It's like having an open computer. Anybody can communicate with them and do whatever they want with it. So we'll submit this and this to you that shows you that, um, that they can be changed, that they were changed, and then exactly how you can do it. Now, we know we're not saying it about any of the machines in Maricopa County, but we haven't seen the machines in Maricopa County, nor have you. This evidence is being submitted to dispute the lies that Dominion and Smartmatic are putting out, which is their machines are perfect, their machines can't be tampered with, their machines are uh, tamper-proof. The reality is their machines are just the opposite. They're completely vulnerable. Is that right, Colonel? And if you look up on the screen, that's uh, exactly what, let me see if I can, do I need to put this at full screen or is it a better, a better I view? I think you need to explain it. So this, this is a, a spider foot reconnaissance uh, tool that uh, looked at dominionvoting.com network that was analyzed on uh, November 3rd. And uh, basically this shows, um, vulnerabilities it shows volume volumetric um, internet traffic the raw data it shows uh, all of the web servers physical coordinates um, all the vulnerabilities that that are associated with the server but basically it does show that um, this was uh, this was connected to the internet on on voting day and the, the volume of traffic was significant and the vulnerabilities that were there are plenty of vulnerabilities that uh, that hackers could uh, penetrate the system. Can you tell if some of those communications went outside the United States? Um, we did observe packet traffic uh, that were going from the U.S. Now, we don't know if it was specifically Dominion traffic uh, going, but to a, to a server in Frankfurt. In Frankfurt, Germany. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor. And who has it? Who has could, uh, Colonel Waldron, could you um, just take a moment and explain packet traffic? Because there's probably a lot of folks who are not sure what that is. So it's, it's, it's bits of information that are sent over the internet from in, in internet protocol from one point to another. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, what's, in, what's in Frankfurt, Germany that would be of interest? Well, we, um, we looked uh, pre prior to the election. Um, one of one of my our white hat hackers and found that uh, there was traffic in a a, a Seidel server. Seidel is one of the companies, and I can show you the uh, we mentioned before the interconnectedness. Um, uh, not that one. The interconnectedness of these uh, 
these companies. So this is sort of a, a historical link to, to all the voting companies. And we got Smartmatic uh, in, the, in the middle. Uh, it's a licensor to Dominion Voting Systems. Seidel runs uh, election uh, night reporting through it, SOE software and Clarity Elections over here. And Clarity Elections is, uh, if, you, if you click up on a lot of the county and Secretary of State voting systems, it'll pop up as property of Clarity Elections. So it doesn't really belong to the counties. It doesn't really belong to you. It really belongs to uh, Clarity Elections. Uh, so, this, I mean, j just to make it simple, a Dominion machine that I go in and vote, it is susceptible to easily having that vote changed from the outside, or by them in particular. By an authorized user or an unauthorized user. By an authorized or unauthorized user? Correct. As a well? Hacker. A hacker. A ha oh, a hacker. So my vote is only as good as the integrity of Dominion and all the hackers that exist that can get into the Dominion machine. Your vote is not as secure as your Venmo account. My, pardon me? Say that one more time. Your vote is not as secure as your Venmo account. Can you think of any reason why any, anyone would hire them to count votes in the United States? I, I could postulate a lot of... Are any of them good reasons? <laughs> um, they have a, a strong lobby. Um, they uh, work with the government. They work with state government agencies. And they've got the infrastructure to sell their services. What could go wrong? Can you now look at, in reference to Arizona, the analysis you did of the vote in Maricopa and Pima counties that was rep uh, reported? It's the uh, Arizona fixing the vote chart. So we, we noticed a difference in Arizona versus the other states. Uh, our team mostly focused on what we call spike analysis which were a, uh, an inject, an electronic inject of uh, a lot of votes, and where the number of votes that were injected in a specific time period exceeded the ability of the, the scanners to process ballots and upload. So basically, it's, it's a signal of a potential anomaly where we would want to go in and do forensic analysis on the ballots that were processed in those batches to, to analyze. Um, the way that these systems work is that you can run votes in, run votes in, run votes in, and if you get write-in ballots or error ballots, it just accumulates them into a batch file. And there may be, you know, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 votes in this batch file, and then the administrator uh, or the tabulator can just go, okay, I'm ready to process batch file, bloop, and they, they send it, and then it records those votes. Uh, in, in the uh, user's manual, there's, you know, ways that it, it shows that the administrator can vote that batch, you know, in a 80%, 20%, 100%, 100%, however the, the administrator chooses. And that basically is a tool to, to allow them to move votes through the system faster. So Arizona was, was a little bit different. Um, it had a a pretty strong rise up right up at the front the first part of voting day whereas the other states and I can show you those have a gradual increase in votes and this may have been due to the fact that um, Arizona allowed early um, counting and tabulation so those batch files could have been dropped in right away but this injection spike uh, at 8.06.40 p.m. And this is uh, adjusted from Zulu time so this is uh, 143,100 votes that were injected. That was uh, in excess of what the, the machines could have processed. Um, the real reason that um, we believe that uh, this spike was a little bit of an anomaly, and uh, uh, should I show the email that was sent to the Arizona legislature? You have the floor, sir. Second. Yes. So this was an anonymous email that was sent to all members of the Arizona legislature. And it was also sent to 
DOJ. Uh, this individual um, sent the email, wanted to remain anonymous, but had enough uh, concern that he sent this to the, the criminal uh, division of the uh, U.S. Department of Justice. Um, he did not want to be included in the investigation, but the information that they recorded was what um, we would like the opportunity to investigate on your behalf or a, a forensics team of, of your choosing. That it doesn't matter to us. But uh, it says that please be advised that Pima County Recorder, located at 240 Northstone Avenue, Tucson, Arizona, uh, in Pima County, Arizona, and the Democratic Party added fraud votes in the initial count to the vote by mail totals released at 8 p.m. on November 3rd, 2020. So this coincides with what we observed uh, in the data analytics at that eight, uh, that, that spike. We weren't aware of this until, this email, until after the fact. So there were approximately 35,000 fraud votes added to each Democratic candidate's vote totals. Candidates impacted uh, include county, state, and federal election candidates. Through the utilization of the automated ballot count machines in Pima County elections, which were not Dominion, but they had the same pretty much functionality. My understanding is that 35,000 uh, was embedded into each Democrat vote totals. Below are the meeting notes. In a meeting I was invited to by the Democrat Party in Pima County, Arizona, on September 10, 2020, no phones or recording devices were allowed. A presentation was given, including detailed plans to embed 35,000 in a spread configured distribution to each Democrat candidate's vote totals. When I asked how in the world that uh, will 35,000 votes be kept hidden from being discovered, it was stated that spread distribution will be embedded across the total registered voter range and will not exceed the registered vote count. And the 35,000 was determined allowable for Pima County based on our county registered vote count. It was also stated that total voter turnout versus total registered voters determine how many votes we can embed. This embedding will auto adjust based on voter turnout because the embed votes are distributed sporadically. All embedded votes will not be found. If audited, because the embeds are in groups of approximately 1,000. This is so county reporter can declare an oversight issue or error as groups of 1,000 is a normal and acceptable error. So if you believe that your one vote counts for one vote, this is a... Uh... Maricopa County's embed totals will be substantially higher than Pima due to embeds being calculated based on the uh, total number of registered voters. When I asked, has this ever been tested and how do we know it works, the response was yes. This has been tested and has shown significant success in Arizona judicial retention elections since 2014. Even undetectable in post audits because no candidate will spend the kind of funds needed to audit and contact voters to verify votes in the full potential of total registered voters, which is more than 500,000 registered voters. This year, our Secretary of State has removed precinct level detail for election night releases so candidates can't see precinct overvotes. This is what I have for the meeting. Just thought I'd report this. Not sure if you can do anything since I was unable to have a recording device in the meeting. Uh, again, we hope this individual would, uh, would come forward and issue this as an affidavit. Um, but um, this is significant. And um, we also uh, noted that the reporting numbers from uh, Pima and Maricopa County merged election day votes with write-in votes with absentee ballots so there's no way to in the publicly available data to uh, parse those votes into uh, into the segments and i believe we noted uh in in the uh, piece of information that was provided to you that maricopa county had 1.9 million um, mail-in ballot request so uh, and those um there was a Maricopa County official on videotape that uh, did say that uh, they did not validate the signatures on the write-in ballots this year. So that's a 1.9 million vote fraud potential, even if it's 0.1% of the vote. There's a lot of room for error. Could we just review that quickly for one second so we get it right? Ladies and gentlemen, please. I, I, I know that you're passionate about this, but there are a lot of people in this world that want to hear this. And if we can't hear the witnesses over remarks, 
that deprives people of hearing the, the truth. So what I take from your testimony, Colonel, is that 35,000 votes were embedded for each Democratic candidate in Pima County. Correct. That, is, were, that is the allegation of this email. The allegation which, by the gentleman who, who hasn't correct. given us an affidavit. Correct. That they were distributed based on the voter turnout carefully so they wouldn't look suspicious. That's correct. And that's essentially what the Dominion, Smartmatic, Ian, that's, that's a, essentially their modus operandi, right? That, that's their They don't just put CTP. in 10,000 votes, they put it in carefully so it's hard to detect. They move the algorithms around to different precincts until they get the, uh, the aggregate number that they want and need and then they, <coughs> shift, they shift the algorithms to, uh, to other precincts. Did, did the Democratic candidates who got the benefit of those 35,000 false votes include uh, Biden and, and Harris? According to this email, it was all local and federal races. So if that were true, then the result of the election is totally opposite the one that they're so anxious to certify. Correct? Yes, sir. And, now, and again, th this, this email need the was sent to every Arizona legislature that, uh, that I'm... Now, we don't know if the gentleman is telling the truth or not. Correct. But as, would it be possible if you had the machines in Pima County to be able to see if there's evidence of this? In order to do that, there would have to be a uh, full forensic audit from the the USB that drives the voting to the PCM CIA, CIA cards, to the tabulators, to the routers. Well, I'm just asking, could, could it be done if you if you had yes. the will to yes, do sir. it? Yes, sir. If you wanted to find out if the vote in Pima County were honest or not, would, wouldn't you do it? Yes, sir. And without doing it, you really have no idea? That's correct. And the machines used in, in Pima County are different, but are they that much more secure? These systems, these, they all have similar vulnerabilities. Uh, our team focused on Dominion. Um, the, our, our partner team focused on ESNS, and they're, they're very similar as far as vulnerabilities. Now, did he say anything that suggests the same thing happened in Maricopa County? Uh, this gentleman appeared to be a, uh, an IT um, specialist in Pima County. So he only uh, wrote <coughs> allegedly to what uh, he observed. And do we have any knowledge that anyone from the state of Arizona attempted to look for him? I believe the, the legislators, uh, some of the legislators did try to, to locate this gentleman. Anybody from law enforcement? Not that I'm aware of, but I, I, again, I'm, I'm not law enforcement, so I'm not sure. But even if you can't find him, you could determine the validity of this or maybe determine the validity of this by doing a forensic audit. Correct. There's, a, there's an available scientific tool that would tell you, I mean, did Biden get 35,000 phony votes? That's correct. And it's not being utilized, as far as you know, by the state of Arizona. Pima County, uh, I, I believe the total um, vote total was less than less than a million in mm -hmm. in Pima County. So it would it would be possible and feasible to do a a full audit, a ballot audit. And um, I, I also was informed that your state um, through the um, the, the Counterterrorism Information Center and the DPS uh, here in Arizona do have the capability to um, analyze and validate ballots for ink uh, consistency. So if there were mass-produced ballots in Maricopa County uh, that were stuffed, uh, your DPS, uh, I've been informed, has the capability to analyze those ballots for paper consistency and ink consistency. So if there were mass-produced ballots, you could determine that on your own. Excuse me, Colonel Aldrin. So I think what you're saying, and I'm going to kind of repeat this back to you, these might be pre-printed pre, pre ballots to simply move through the system. Is that what you're suggesting? There are indications. Uh, we have affidavits from Pennsylvania that uh, there were ballots that were pre-positioned in a uh, bobtail trailer, a tractor trailer truck.
Okay. And that uh, these ballots were, uh, the, 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 the thought was that this was a, uh, a cache that they could go and grab the amount of ballots they needed and take them to the specific tabulation centers. And that, that's a, an, an affidavit that's uh, from, from our Pennsylvania work. But this uh, Colonel, is a so repeat one more time the piece of information that I think people were shocked about, because it is hard to believe. Uh, did you say that a Pima County official said that they didn't validate any of the mail-in votes? That was Maricopa. County. Maricopa. They didn't Sorry. validate the signature. They didn't validate the signatures on the mail-in ballots. And, and that's 1.9 million. Correct. And do we know who that is? Uh, I would have to get the video. Uh, well, could you get it for us? Uh, oh, yes, sir. Now you have to do it right now, but before the end of the hearing. That would render every one of the 1.9 million votes absolutely never checked for fraud, deceit, mistake. And if they're mail-in votes, that can't be done now. They've been separated from the envelope. Correct. That would indicate. The so those are basically 1.9 million votes that are illegal votes. Or that had the potential to be illegal votes that weren't validated. The signature but, but, but can we can we determine now if any of them are legal or illegal if the envelopes were separated from the ballots there would be no way to tell a ballot for candidate you could still go back and look at the envelopes to validate the signatures but you wouldn't know what the ballot uh, and isn't that the reason you're supposed to have an observer when you do that that is uh, that is part of the chain of custody procedures I believe in Arizona and when they talk about chain of custody, that's what they're talking about, right? Correct. Because a lot of witnesses are going to talk about that. So let's just sum up a few of the things that you also found. Tell us about the green button in Maricopa County on the machine. And uh, there is one witness that's going to testify that all day she saw election officials constantly pressing the green button when somebody was voting. So what, what that was when a, when a voter wasn't sure, and I, I believe this was also linked to uh, another um, witness that's going to talk about with the, the, the differences in the pins and the Sharpies uh, that the Maricopa Elections Division, in early voting, they specified that only use ballpoint pins for voting, and then on election day, they specified only use Sharpies. And the, the idea is that uh, as the bleed through on the ballot, as the scanners would cause an error and an error ballot. Uh, it, by creating the error ballot, the election officials basically would slide those votes into a batch file that could be adjudicated by the election administrator or the operator. And the, the green button was to say, okay, there's an error, but go ahead and push cast ballot, and it punches that into, uh, uh, into an error file that can be adjudicated by the election administrator. Now, and you examined the, the uh, voter database, and your team did, right? <coughs> Say again, sir. You examined the voter database, you and your team. Uh, those were actually some local um, Arizona folks that examined that. So you took that from I, I spoke state directly data? To oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. You spoke directly local, to whom? To, to uh, local investigators here. And. You have here voter database discrepancies. 6,000 voters, at least, entered into database with no sex and default date of birth, and they're non-existent in Lexis Nexus. Correct, and I, and I believe uh, there will be a, a witness to, to discuss that later this morning. So unless those can be, if, unless those can be discovered, those votes would have to be, would have to be eliminated. Correct. And it was explained to me that uh, the way that happens is that they, uh, you can register online for a driver's license. At the same time, you can register for uh, voter registration. Uh, but the driver's license doesn't require the same information as the voter rolls. And so those kind of go into a queue that the Secretary of State would approve for the voter rolls over time. But there appear to be 6,000 voters uh, that were on the voter rolls in the voter database with no sex and a default date of birth. So in other words, they entered 0101, you know, 1900 or, or whatever that date was. They also discovered over 2,000 votes that used 
a false address, an address of a vacant lot. Correct. You are already told us about the 1,915,487 nine hundred and fifteen mail-in votes that were not verified with regard to signature in Pima County, in Maricopa County. Maricopa, correct. Also, in Pima and Maricopa County, Republican poll watchers were very often forced to stay un inside, outside, una and unable to view the vote processing. Correct. The other, and the other is there an estimate of the number of illegal immigrants that voted in the in the election? Has anyone done an estimate of that? The um, American Immigration Council suggests that there are uh, about 300,000 uh, ineligible voters. And then the uh, uh, one of the local newspaper uh, reported that there were another 300 and 12,000, I believe, um, non-incarcerated felons and other illegal, uh, other ineligible voters. Has any attempt been made to investigate that to determine if they can locate a sufficient number of illegal immigrants voting illegally that would have a bearing on the outcome of the election? That would really be done by the, uh, you know, the county election fixers. Who but it ha hasn't been election. done. Not, not. And they're going to certify the vote apparently without doing it. I'm not. I'm not aware if they. Well, it would be. Not. You'd have to be an idiot not to think that illegal Im aliens, and immigrants, voted, right? It, it's very possible. How many are there in 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 um, Arizona? Approximately. That's Anybody's it. guess, but what's the lowest number? That, that Can anybody help me with that? Question for the the, the local legislatures. Or Five million, four million. I wish we Mr. knew, sir. Mr. Pardon me. I wish we knew. Mr. Chairman, what's the lowest number we could use? Uh, Four million? Representative Cook. M Mr. Chairman, uh, my colleague, Representative Townsend, and I have had several discussions over the past few weeks about that number, and she could provide that to Mr. Giuliani. Mr. Chair. Please, Ms. Townsend. Mr. Chair, is this on? Thank you. And uh, Mr. Giuliani, Mayor Giuliani, um, I, I can't tell you how many people are in this state that are potentially can vote illegally as a, an illegal alien, but I can tell you that there is a way for them to vote under the federal only voter program, meaning that someone here illegally or a fake name, uh, anybody that can put together a, a voter registration card with a fake name or if they're not eligible to vote and are not in the MVD system here in Arizona, when they register to vote, if they're not found in the MVD system, the DMV system, they're not there, then they're contacted to see, do you have a birth certificate? Do you have anything to prove your citizenship? When they don't answer, then their name is relegated to the federal only voter list, which there's 36,000 in the state of Arizona of people who can't prove their citizenship, can't prove they exist, other than when they show up to election day, all they have to do is show their bank statement, their title to their car, anything you can reproduce on your own computer with your fake name on there or whatever, and onto a bank statement and you get a ballot and you can vote for president and your congressperson and senator so uh, up to 36,000 uh, plus people in Arizona could potentially vote and I do have the numbers of who has voted in Maricopa County is uh, 4,100 um, of the true federal only and another 4,000 that are out of supposedly out of state so those alone um, haven't been researched deeply enough to know does that name even exist as a person and are they here is that some, someone here who's here illegally or not so we don't know up to upwards of 8,000 people in Maricopa County alone who have cast a ballot who weren't able to well I mean, that's pretty astonishing so I will say and I may be wrong but let's say there were five million illegal aliens in Arizona it is um, it's beyond credulity that a few hundred thousand didn't vote, particularly given Representative Townsend's explanation that there's an encouragement that goes on to have them vote. Now, every one of those votes would be an illegal vote. Every one of those votes denies a lawful voter of their franchise, it just wipes it out. Has there been any attempt to try and investigate that after the election even on a sample basis like 
going to a, a district where there are a large number of possible illegal aliens and go back and check the names and see Mr. were there 5,000, were there 10,000, were Mr. there 20,000? Has there been even an attempt to do that? Mr. Okay. Chair. None that I'm aware of. Well, I mean, I think, totally think, yeah. can, I, can I speak to that, Mayor? Yes, please. Yes, please. please. So we put in, uh, um, two years ago, we put in a, an elections integrity unit in the uh, Attorney General's office, and I've been on the phone with them asking them what are they going to be doing, how can they look into this, and they told us that they don't have the authority to go out and look for a crime. They have to have it presented to them, so they can't go out and do an audit. They can't go out and, um, and actively research this. I also was told the same thing by the Board of Supervisors that they cannot perform an audit um, above and beyond what's already been done that's in statute. So all we're really left with that I'm aware of is having, and, and as much as I appreciate this forum today, and I, I'm very grateful for you, we need an actual committee hearing. Like, I'm the chair of the Elections Committee. If we were to hold an actual committee hearing, we would have subpoena power to go and look at the machines, to look at these things, uh, you know, uh, and inspect them, and, and get down to it. So we can do an audit. We just need to conduct a committee hearing to give us that subpoena power to be able to do so. Mr. Giuliani. So when, when this vote is certified, if that's not done, there is no question in any reasonable person's mind that the vote totals contain large numbers of illegal votes from people who are not citizens of the United States. The question is, how many? And the officials certifying have made no effort to find out the truth, which seems to me gives the state legislature a perfect reason to take over the conduct of this election because it's being conducted irresponsibly and unfairly. And why, and why, and why doesn't your state legislature exercise its responsibility under the Constitution. Well, the first step. <laughs> Mr. Giuliani, that, that is the essential question that we are here to ask. Good. Um, so now, any, anything else? Uh, yeah. Colonel, you did a great job. He's available for any more questions. Um, if you are done. All day. If, if you are done, Mr. Giuliani, we, we do have a number of questions from the panel members for you, sir. Good. Yes, sir. All right. um, the first thing I'd like to ask is, um, you spoke on system capability, and I know that much has been made of the excoriation of the state of Texas on the Dominion equipment, software, and all that. Um, can you provide just a very short comment on what, why they said? Not only are we not recommending this, we're prohibiting the use of this equipment in our state. Uh, in a nutshell, vulnerabilities that were um, issued, not addressed, and not fixed. There, there were too many system vulnerabilities. Okay. And you also referenced uh, a comment about DHS. And it, I'm struggling with why did DHS say security for this election was the best it had ever been? Do, do you have any insight into that? Uh, in my experience in life, uh, there's, there's generally two factors for individual. I mean, it's either competence or commitment. So they were either incompetent or not committed to learning the truth at, at the senior leader level, not okay. at the operator level. And does DHS know about the information that you've shared with us or that you're sharing with us in, in the process of this? Have you shared that with them specifically? And much more. So beyond what you're saying here, you've gone into much greater depth. Yeah, our, our, um, we have relationships with our local. Um, we have relationships with our local DHS personnel in Texas, mm -hmm. and both the uh, the intelligence divisions and CISA. Um, when I started working on this project in August, uh, I called them up, said, "You guys have you guys have got to come out and look at it." They did. They spent. Um, an initial three hours going through this data. Uh, at the end of that, one of them said, I think I need to go outside and throw up. Okay, besides that, 
Did they do anything about it? They had multiple follow-ups. Um, they uh, drove up to our Dallas uh, counterpart team, uh, received uh, over 600 gigabytes of data that had been accumulated over, over time. Um, our team provided them over 200 gigabytes of confirmatory data, and they analyzed that. Um, after, they, uh, after they analyzed, um, there was a, uh, a scan, a passive scan done. Uh, they uh, conducted a, a limited scan and determined that there were vulnerabilities. Uh, they held numerous meetings uh, at, with their folks, the cyber, the CISA cyber side and the INA, which is the Intelligence Assessment Division. And I'm, I'm sorry, could, CISA, could you let the folks who are watching know what CISA is? CISA is the, the, the agency in DHS that's responsible for cyber and infrastructure. Okay. Members, any other questions? Uh, Representative Biasucci. Uh, thank you. One, one note that might be in, important. Um, members of the elections division of CISA, uh, I was told would never attend the meetings or the briefings that uh, were conducted internal to DHS on the, the material that we had presented. And I'm sorry, who is that that did not participate? The election security division within inside of DHS. Okay, thank you. Representative Biasucci. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Colonel. I just wanted to uh, make sure I have this correct. So when we're talking about, it was Mr. Kreb, Krebs, is that correct? Correct. Okay. He stated the most secure election in history. He stated uh, we're not connected to the internet. He stated no votes leave this country. This is all things he's stated. He stated publicly. So well, are you just a website, correct? Right. So are you willing to say under oath that you have seen the connection to the internet? You have seen it go offshore to Germany, Frankfurt. Are these things that you have personally seen and can say that is not true? Our our white hat hackers, yes, they have that traffic in the packets. So. Why would he? Why would he make that kind of comment? Do you think? Either not knowing, <laughs> believing the myth, um, or not wanting the truth to, to be known. Thank you, Senator Burley. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This one. Uh, good morning, Colonel. Uh, I've got a, a couple questions on on the, the Board of Supervisors during one of their hearings it said that uh that the text for this equipment that's by the way the county doesn't own this equipment uh, it's leased by uh, dominion and smartmatic uh, but would you is it irregular is it sop for the tech reps to be there during the election process yeah that that's been something we observed in in michigan and pennsylvania uh, whether they're full-time dominion employees or contractors uh, there are Dominion employees that are there to run the equipment. Because at the Board of Supervisors hearing, they had they'd actually made comments that they actually provided them an office space uh, with uh, in the county uh, for them to, to handle this stuff. My question is: a couple weeks ago, they did a, a test just to show that the, uh, how the system was uh, secure. So they did it before and, and mid and then after test, so everybody could see that they, um, the Board of Supervisors and, and the county elections that see this is this is cannot so what you're hearing is false obviously or is it during that test is uh, can they find the anomalies in there during that that basically what I always call a dog and pony show uh, is, would that show up in one of these tests in, in a forensics examination no just uh, see come here and look at it. this is how we certify the machines calibrate the machine whatever zero it out this and that obviously these anomalies would not be showing up during that that moment correct correct and and it's our understanding that uh, dominion had a, a a software update at least uh, in a couple states i'm not sure about maricopa county but like the day before the election uh, representative bartow any questions I did have one question. Thank you, and Colonel. Excellent uh, information. Um, you described web traffic increase during the election as opposed to uh, how do you measure the increase? Um, are, are you talking just in 
in in the, on the Dominion server yes. network. Yes. They just look at volume, volume of data that that's moving through the pipes. And I, I'm not a our our hacker team is that's they're the experts. Um, I just kind of the the big picture know how to dance it, but they do they do measure volume traffic. Matter of fact, on the, the, the Frankfurt server on election day, there was a German uh, cybersecurity professor that um, was noting that the increase in traffic was, you know, he, and he related it back to COVID and said, you know, we're, we haven't even hit our indoors winter season yet, mm -hmm. and we've hit the highest uh, traffic. And he specifically noted that uh, one of the reasons was the American elections. Was it an exponential increase? Um, I don't think it's been exponential, but I think it went from seven, seven point something terabytes a second to ten terabytes. So it went to a lot of, you know, a, a pretty big increase, not an exponential though. Okay, to my uh, unqualified mind, I don't know exactly what that means, but it sounds big. They, they, the volume jumped up pretty significantly on on November third and fourth to Great. that particular server in the pipes. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, Colonel Waldron, so essentially about 33, 34, 35 percent increase? Uh, I would have to go back and look at the numbers, but. I mean, that, you're sort of from seven ballpark. to 10. Ballpark. Yeah. yeah, that's big. I can't remember the exact Yeah, numbers. all right, very good. Uh, Senator Gowan, do you have any questions? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Colonel, you talking about the um, SGO system. And that was, uh, uh, you said uh, Hugo Chavez, he was a uh, uh, partial owner in that. Now, that's, that's the beginning of Dominion? Um, SGO was a, was a separate company, but Dominion acquired uh, Sequoia Systems that was spun off of SGO. And they also acquired Premier, uh, which was spun off of Diebold, but they all have a common the common core of the common code really goes back to um, SGO and that one org, org chart that I put up there kind of showed the, the licensing agreements that go back and forth between SGO and Dominion. So it's the, 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 the licensing for the, for the software and the code. So it still stems from the SGO system? That's correct. So, um, and then you're stating uh, Dominion owns the data. So does that mean when they see the vote count that they own that, not the the county's estate? They process it. They retain it. It's in their backup servers. So they have they have the votes themselves as well when that's supposed to be property of the state. They've got they've got the data. They've got the voter okay. voter data, voter registrations. And then uh, um, you said Dominion sits on the board of Mr. Krabs, is that right? That was uh, on, on the, uh, the CISA website. Their, uh, when, when you say the board, what is the board? It was their Election Security Advisory Council. Oh, okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, let's see. Representative Roberts, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Colonel Walton, earlier you were talking about the methods um, via internet and internal methods as far as, um, I think you used the term, uh, I forgot exactly how you said it. Um, there was basically methods from the internet and then also internally that uh, there could be uh, manipulation of votes. Um, so my question is, is there, do you have any knowledge of were the machines in Arizona connected to the internet at any point in time? And if not, or if so, are there logs internally in these machines that if we were to be able to subpoena these machines and demand them so they could be examined, could, could we see all of those changes that were made? So when, when you watch um, CBS, CNN, any of the, the mainstream media where they've got the live vote updates, that data is passed live. I mean, it's, it's as the votes are updated. So it's, you know, not, nobody's getting in a plane and flying the hard drive to New York. I mean, it's, it's uploaded and it's connected. So it's, it is connected to, to the internet and whether it's 
locally, I mean, they can move votes uh, with the cards, the voter cards. Uh, those can be preloaded and laptops with, with the software that, that could be interdicted and upload um, fake votes, as in the allegation from, from Pima County, you know, in, in batches of 1,000. They can scan blank ballots, and then the administrator can allocate that batch of blank ballots to one candidate or another, either in 100% or any percentages that they uh, they allocate in the, you know, according to the user's manual. So, so that, to that point, just give me, indulge me just a moment. Would you say that that is what we saw in the 2018 election with Governor Bevin, where we actually saw on television, real time, the movement of some 500 votes from one candidate to another. I mean, it was so stark, you saw them go down on one and up on the other on the exact number. Would that be a manifestation of what you're talking about? So the, uh, the, high, the working hypothesis from our, our counterparts on that, because they worked out and watched it, and they actually went to, to Kentucky to assist the team there, was that that was a server level uh, uh, interdiction. So they went up to the server, downloaded a CSV, CSV file, changed the votes, and re-uploaded it. Thank you. Representative. Robert. So um, just to kind of tack on to what we were just discussing, it's my understanding because there was an article here in Arizona um, from the Arizona Daily Independent. There was a quote unquote whistleblower that was talking about issues that they had observed. And so one of the things they were talking about was that the data from the machines was being moved via the hard drive. So. Um, what you just described as far as the real-time data being uploaded and all that stuff, um, just for the layman, um, that same type of manipulation, whether you're plugging in an Ethernet cable or um, what have you, or you're doing it on uh, an, a user interface, um, that same type of malfeasance could, could be accomplished in that method as well. And I think in, in looking at these systems, we identified, you know, almost a dozen ways that you could inject or interdict to manipulate votes on that note you said earlier that pretty much all of these machines have vulnerabilities so is there any system out there that you're aware of that is uh, um, worth exploring or do we just need to go back to the paper ballot um, there is uh, MIT uh, developed a system um, with uh, some capital infusion. It's, it's a system called uh, Votes, V-O-A-T-Z, and it's a, a blockchain type system. Um, again, it's uh, when I first became aware of this, I went and talked to some friends of mine who were bank presidents, and I said, okay, why can't we apply banking principles? Because if you want anything done right, you go talk to the money people. That's, that's, that's who protects their stuff. <laughs> And he said, oh, yeah, this is the, and it's an app. You can do it as an app with, uh, tie it in with real ID and a blockchain type solution or, you know, the, the next generation solution. Um, but there are systems, and I, I believe uh, the votes system is, is uh, deployed right now. I believe there, and I know West Virginia is, is one that I remember reading on, uh, on their website. Thank you. Um, sir, Senator Allen. Any questions? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Please Chair. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Thank you for here today. Uh, I'd like to go back to the Board of Supervisors letter where they talk about certifying the Maricopa County election. And um, they have uh, five points that they make for the reason why they call this a reliable uh, election. And um, my concern is, of course, over the Dominion uh, tabulation equipment. They said it was vetted by a bipartisan uh, equipment certification advisory committee before the contract was finalized. And as required by law, the committee tested the functionality and accuracy of tabulation equipment before it was used in any Arizona election. Well, after listening to your testimony, that does not give me any confidence because the machines, of course, can perform very accurately, it is after, it's after the fact, after the election starts, after the ballot is, is starting to be uh, put into the machine that, that these problems start arising. So uh, is that accurate to say that, that this does not, should not give us confidence about this being a reliable election? Uh, Ma'am, anything that is software-based 
can be manipulated and changed with a click of a button or you know you got two USB drives plug one in and you get one algorithm you pull it out you plug another one in you get a different algorithm uh, and we also believe on the, the connectedness these can be pushed down from the top and shifted down so think of it like um, a casino or a state lotto you're uh, who, whoever owns the eye in the sky you, you can control the margins and that's really I think what what we're looking at well uh, certainly from your testimony uh, I can see that and I have one more question if I could mr. chairman I believe um, Senator Burley has it to that point if you all right go ahead I, I yield. All right, um, please proceed. Well, I, I was going to switch down to the 1% uh, early ballots that they did, and I had a question about that. So, Sonny, if you have something to what I said before, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Colonel, so basically what you're saying, uh, for example, since the techs are already there on site during the process, mm -hmm. so if a machine jams up and naturally they call the tech over there to go fix the unjam, they could literally, without anybody noticing, because they're the techie people, they can stick a thumb drive in there and upload, change the numbers, manipulate, whatever. We, there was an affidavit in, uh, in Pennsylvania the, from, I think it was last week. Um, a gentleman's supervisor had a Ziploc bag full of USB drives and they noted that uh, he was inserting the USB drives into the machines at a much higher rate uh, than would be necessary <laughs> they had seen in the past. Okay. Very, very so now I have it to that point. <laughs> Forgive me, but it, what I think you're saying is that they have just created an electronic footprint either in the data download that you're seeing real time, that you'd be seeing some kind of a, a spike, or is there something that's captured on the machine that it's itself, like a, a memory card that is resident on the machine, not that, that is actually talking to the hard drive? The uh, the machines for the most part at the voting machines are just run by you know removable software and data cards that the the cards that actually hold the votes the uh, the backup servers is really where the true story would uh, would reside as far as the uploads downloads to change the uh, the error warnings for the the mismatch errors so would you be able to show with specificity a machine in Maricopa County going all the way across the pond inserting data into a server or would it be an aggregate of all the machines that were in Maricopa County for example is it by individual tabulator or is it by the server here that collects can you help me understand that piece let me uh, I'll that probably goes back to your headache graph, I'm thinking. Yeah, a schematic that, that sort of shows that. The reason I ask the question is we're still looking for evidence, and if that is in the evidence package, that's certainly something that we would want to know about. If, if we don't have it today, um, something that could be forwarded to the body would be great. Uh, let me see if I can make this bigger. So this is uh, Dominion voting, the high level. Um, it's a block diagram of how everything's connected, and I can print this off and provide it to you or whoever uh, would, would do your uh, your audits but uh, it's kind of hard to kind of hard to see when it's blown up but uh, you've got uh, the ballot boxes ballots taken out this tracks all the way through the image cast central to ballot images and this is really what's voted the the ballots are scanned into these image casters and there's an electronic image created it goes into results files and then it goes into validation adjudication auditing reporting and publishing and then to democracy suite EM ems the democracy suite servers the database servers the document management servers and it kind of shows you how this all goes out to 
to the world from from this whole system. Um, election data, you know, this is kind of the top feed to all these servers, but this is really, it's, it's a network, I mean, it's a computer company. It's all, it's all networked, it has to be. So let me reframe the question. We probably would not be able to identify any specific tabulation machine showing up on the server because it's all aggregated. Yeah, it's it's these tabulation machines go through this process, but the the results files. So if you work it backwards from the server, you would be able to go back to a ballot image, an electronic ballot image. All right, thank you, uh, Senator Allen. You yes. have another question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the other thing in this letter by the Board of Supervisors was uh, they commented uh, again of what made this a reliable election that uh, the election day ballots from 2% of vote centers and 1% of early ballots is required by Arizona law and it yielded a 100% match to the results produced by the tabulation equipment. So that should give us, you know, and, and all the counties do this. They do this hand count, this little audit of a small percent of the votes to see how it matches up to the machine. Uh, so uh, could you explain how we shouldn't have confidence in that particular, how, how, can, they, how can they make that match up to the machine then when they just arbitrarily pick out 1%? If, there, if there's vote dumps that are happening and, and things that are happening throughout the process. I, I would just say it's, it's something we learned a long time ago, garbage in, garbage out. If you've got 1.9 million votes that aren't, the signatures aren't verified and they're just reading bubbled in, you know, ballot cards, then yes, the ballot cards, when they run a thousand ballot cards through are going to come out with a thousand. So that you know, that small batch would represent what those particular ballots say, but there's, again, there's, that's why there's chain of custody requirements, that's why there's verification requirements at each step along the way. So if each one of those, if one of those steps is broken, then the validity of the whole process is, is in question. You know, it's, you just don't know. Right. Thank you. I think we're, we're definitely, sir, in a, a new day when it comes to what is taking place across this country with voting, and we're going to have to probably really look at that. Thank Re you. Representative Townsend, do you have any questions? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Colonel, I just have a quick uh, follow-up to some of the stuff we've been talking about as far as the security of the machines themselves. And as we know, like whether or not something happened or didn't happen, uh, I'm most concerned with voter confidence. And if there's all these holes, then we're, we're going to really deflate or collapse voter confidence. So I would like you to reassure me on one particular item in the tabulation room at the MCTEC here in Phoenix. Um, in years past, it was you had to have a special badge and only people that were certified to be in that room with the machines and the tabulation and all that were allowed in there. This year, uh, I was told yesterday we had teams of 25 adjudicators in that room, in the tabulation room with those machines. It, would it have been possible for someone in that scenario to wander over to the machine and have a conversation and put in this thumb drive you're talking about? Or, or is it deeper than that or something that's happened from remotely? Or how secure are these machines? Because we know that there's no chain of custody on the hard drives. And on you know the machines we saw in a video left alone for almost a week in one of the voting centers, untended, unsecure, uh, you know, what, how could somebody, a, a regular person with nefarious intentions, walk up and change this whole election by putting in a thumb drive and changing an algorithm? Is that something that could have happened or we don't have to worry about that? Um, either uh, an individual that has knowledge of the systems and how to you know, operate in the system could have an impact, again, from the server. By, they, could, they could be sitting in... Uh, Nigeria in a you know <laughs> you know as long as they've got an internet connection they could get to that particular server if they were had access to you know the the data from the malware that's on the server they could get the login and password from you know a, a Pima County operator or you know a Maricopa County operator so 
there, there are just so many places that they can be uh, interdicted or, or penetrated. Um, there's just there's just too many to you know to describe. But there's a lot of a lot of ways it could be interdicted. But Mr. Chair and Colonel, so you, what I'm hearing you say is I can't be confident that a, a volunteer of a political party that you know the the entire recorder's office and the elections director can everyone could have been on the up and up and this is the most secure election ever but if one random volunteer with the right information were to be in the tabulation room could have then breached the security of the of the machine correct and, and therefore we cannot stand here and say we are confident with that kind of access to these machines machines left in buildings for a week we cannot say with certainty that this is a secure election and we have a hundred percent confidence that nothing went wrong and and you just brought up that the chain of custody issue and that that's that's a critical vulnerability path so that if the chain of custody was broken then you really you really don't know you can't you can't say with confidence that uh, it was a fair. <coughs> Thank you. And Mr. Chair and Colonel, last point. If you were in charge, would you want a recount? Would you want an audit? Would you want a do over? What would you do? Um, a forensic audit will tell you what was processed. But to uh, the mayor's point earlier, as soon as those mail in ballots, which were 1.9 million requested, and I think. A good, a good roughly return. Uh, if those signatures weren't verified, then you know you can count the same things over and over again. But you know, it's, it's you're, you're starting with flawed results already. Um, an audit, a full audit, would be able to tell you if those were, you know, bad, bad ballots or pre-printed ballots. You know, you you could do a full forensic audit on the actual ballots. But uh, once the envelopes are separated from the ballots on that many mail-in ballots, it's 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 almost it's almost impossible to, to go back without doing a, a forensic analysis of each ballot and the paper and the ink. Okay, and Mr. Chair, and Colonel, do you have any information about potential shipments of ballots to Arizona and other places from North Korea or something like? Do you have any information like that? There there were several affidavits that were provided uh, to the the legal teams. I don't have those affidavits uh, with me now, but there were affidavits and, and suggestions, and I think more of those are um, in, in process to, to, to obtain more affidavits on those processes. M Mr. Mayor, Thank do you. You, can you tell us whether or not you have got, the, I don't know if you heard the question, or do you have affidavits that uh, counterfeit ballots were somehow shipped into Arizona? I have to look. Uh, all right. Thank you. Representative Cook, any questions? Yes, Mr. yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and I'll I'll make it brief. But I do have some stuff that I'd like to say. Is that, <clears throat> Colonel, when I ran for office in 2016, I got a phone call one day that one of our county recorder's office information had been breached, and all of the voter information was for sale on the dark web. That was my first instance of being as a becoming representative about this hacking and computer stuff and what's out there. I just went through my third election as the top vote getter, and I would like to say that I continuously have been tried to be hacked on my personal or ledge account or, or whatever is out there on the internet. I later learned from people, Colonel, that the reason why this is done out of the country, and according to your graph, is that it is harder for us to track these people down and prosecute them when these computer anomalies and things happen from outside the country inside our country and state would that be true we would not have the legal jurisdiction to go seize or search a server outside of the u.s thank you colonel and would this make sense that if you had a simple phone number and then you went on the internet and then researched that phone number of where you received a text message and it was from ukraine would that not be a red flag that your phone or information was trying to be attacked or uh, infiltrated? Correct, it would be. Okay, so moving on to that, Colonel, what I've noticed is that about these voting machines and these plugged-in USB drives, 
When in fact, when we watch across this great country of ours, in many states, we have a very few amount of counties compared to other states in here. You've got to target two counties. If you notice that rural Arizona and rural Arizona legislators are up here, we're ready to go to work today. Our constituents demand it, and we demand it as their representatives to work for them to solve these problems. But, but what happens, Colonel, is that the same thing when we look at this country on a map and counties that vote for the President Trump versus counties that don't, it's the population and the masses. So I'm going to get to my point about Maricopa and Pima County. Okay, we all, in rural Arizona, we call it the great state of Maricopa because Maricopa County has more legislators at the legislature than rural Arizona does. If we add all of ours up, we still don't have the numbers to be an equal voice at the state legislature, but we have to work harder, which we can. So if we look at Maricopa and Pima County, if I was going to, now we're going to get down to vote centers, okay, targeted vote centers, Colonel, I wouldn't have to have a USB drive or to infiltrate every voting machine in every vote center in Maricopa and Pima County, would I? Or would I just need to target those individual voting centers in those two massive counties in the state to do what you are saying to take votes and shift them over in those numbers. What, do you understand what I'm asking? I've, I've seen analyses that uh, boil down national elections to zip codes, to just zip codes. Mr. Chairman, I get fired up when I get into this stuff because I read and hear everything that, that these people have said. I, it has happened to me. And uh, I just thank you again for your information, confirmation. But when I go back to the 2016 hacking, what I see as a pattern, Colonel, is that there is a plan. There is a larger plan, and it's not a conspiracy theory, and I'm not nuts. But if I wanted to engage in a plan in 2016, Colonel, would I not start hacking and getting the voter databases and information of projecting of why do we have, what is the number, 2,000 or 1,200 voters, I believe, in Maricopa County registered that I believe have voted at a vacant lot? I mean, if I really wanted to go down the road, isn't that the way you would target it? Yeah, there, and again, it's, it's, you can interdict this in multiple levels and multiple methods and I think that's what's happened it's a there there's so much out there and it's it's to, to your point you know you're, you're not a conspiracy theorist but it's really hard they have made it so hard for the public to understand it and we call that in uh, deception operations ambiguity increasing and mr. So, thank you mr. chairman mr. colonel I have the last question is and what concerns me over what I've uh, read and seen is that could the data that you say could be traced back only to the scan ballot at this point, so it can't go back to the individual voting machines, could that be bleach bits or whatever that stuff is? Could that be, could, could the tracks, as long, the longer we take to actually get the machines and check these things out, could there be time to erase that information and cover up if there was a crime or misdealings? There could, but now the batch files will go back to the precinct and the machines on the tapes. So there, you, you can track it all the way back to the machines and the precincts by the, the tapes. And it's what we showed in the uh, Antrim County, uh, those, those printouts on the, uh, on the precinct level. So that you, you can go back. Um, but really all that's necessary to do, you know, there's not really a, a, a bleach bit. It's just pulling the USB drive out of the, out of the voter machine and the tabulators. So the, the machines themselves, uh, other than the servers, really don't have a lot of resident uh, information. The, the tabulation machines, you know, they can have some stored images, but the, the you know, where they, you retain these, uh, you know, the federal election requirements require, uh, and I can't remember the U.S. code title, 46 rings a bell, but the 22-month retention of uh, federal elections records it would be done in those uh, the uh, the ballot images and you know, electronic backups. So the data is retained, and there you know you can do forensics on it as long as it's the actual 
the actual servers and the actual machines. Colonel, thank you for your time, your patriotism, and Mr. Chairman, I yield any remaining time I may have. Thank you. Um, I believe Senator Gowan has one more question, and uh, I just need to remind the panel, time grows short. I think uh, Mayor Giuliani has significant more uh, witnesses and evidence that he'd like to have heard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Colonel. I just want to get on, uh, come back to the uh, Dominion situation here. Where are the where are the backup servers? I'm sorry. Where are the backup servers? Um, I am not exactly sure. I can try to get that information provided to you. And this company, I think the mayor said they were a foreigner company. The Canadian is that what it is? So we know we know there are um, sites in. Uh, Toronto, their, their offices are in Canada, so we know that we know that there were data there. Uh, they also have servers uh, in Serbia in other other companies. But as far as knowing for sure where the data from Maricopa County went and resides, uh, we don't know that. But they've got backup servers. So an audit, because we talked about that a little earlier. Um, first off, with that find where the uh, where the server is and where the information would be Trace, tracing the flow of the information yes sir the audit would do that correct and but it also tell us whether or not it's true or not that the 1.9 million uh, signatures were or were not verified right so we would have an absolute uh, so knowledge of that Colonel, could you get a little bit closer to the microphone I'm getting a lot of people who are Sorry. saying I can't hear the guy talk okay so you. the the adjudication of the signatures on the uh, the ballots that would be a, a totally separate wouldn't be necessarily a digital uh, forensic process but that audit would be um, you know have to be conducted at the county level on all those on all the envelopes so if we did a, uh, an audit if we were able to do that um, tell me the things that could come out of that well, if the signatures on the envelopes were invalid, um, you could necessarily get a percentage of the votes that would be disqualified. But again, when when the ballots are separated from the envelopes, you know you can't tell which ballot came from which envelope. So really, all that would tell you is a percentage of that, um, the percentage of those mail-in or absentee ballots that were not legitimate so what would the what could the server tell us the server would basically tell you all the electronics so once the ballots are processed the batches and the uh, the uh, images that'll that'll tell you where all those goes and, and and it'll also tell you any changes to the software any updates uh, algorithms that were in place and that's all present at the at the code level and that's really what um, these companies have balked at providing access to the code because they say that that's their intellectual property and it's uh, they've been successful at preventing folks from analyzing the code so th they're they're utilizing their their system for our elections but it's their property and and counties and states have signed up for that thank you Senator Burley, yes. um, final you, question. Yes. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Chairman and Colonel, just for clarity, n not only can these machines be manipulated uh, with a thumb dryer and everything else, it can be changed remotely outside the voting center. That's, that's correct, and there are references in the user's manual that show how they can do that. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Giuliani, anything else with your witness here? All right. I think we covered everything. Uh, thank, thank you, sir. You, Colonel. Um, do you have a, a next witness? I'm, I'm looking at the clock, and I know that we've got a time management issue with, with one of our witnesses. Uh, yes, I think we should call Anna Orth. Okay. Because she has an appointment, and we'll call her first. Okay. And then after that, um, Senator Pat Kolbeck. Uh, we need to make sure that we have yes, him sir. at the airport by 1 o'clock. All right. Thank you very much. Anna Horth. Is Anna Orth here? Anna Horth 
Anna Horth. Or Anna Horth. All right, we'll check on her. And let's go then right. to. All right, uh, Senator Pat Kolbeck. D just so folks know that we've got folks uh, in a separate room, just so that we can bring them out and have some kind of order here. Senator Kolbeck. Thank you, sir. If you would, could you please introduce yourself? Yes, my name is uh, Michigan, former Michigan State Senator Patrick Kolbeck. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you, Mr. Chair, and the esteemed panel members. Um, for eight years, I was sitting on the other side of this testimony. I was where you were sitting, and hopefully I'll be able to provide kind of a unique perspective on what to look out for in this uh, election. If you excuse me, I'm going to try to get my presentation up here and get that going. Kick it up. Yeah, technology is great until you want to use it. It's more difficult when you can't see. <laughs> nice job on the resolution of the screen here, by the way. Okay. And just for background purposes, as we're Looking for it to recognize my USB flash drive. There we go. Much better. Voila. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, we still don't have it on the screen yet. Ah, there we go. All right. And if you if you would please put it in play mode so we can see it. All right. Please proceed. All right. Thank you very much. Um, it was a perfect compliment, I think, to Colonel Waldron's testimony here because uh, uh, kind of got a unique experience regarding this whole election process. Um, First of all, I am a former Michigan State Senator. I served on the Senate, Michigan Senate Elections and Government Reform Committee. I took those duties very seriously to the point of diagramming out all of our election processes. So I had a pretty good understanding of how elections were supposed to work from a book perspective. Um, but uh, another perspective that's useful to this discussion is that um, something that I couldn't do while I was running for office is actually uh, I served as a poll challenger in Detroit at the AV County Board um, for the election day from 5 p.m. through the next day into the evening of the following day on November 4th. So I was actually at the Detroit AV County Board. So you may have heard about all the things that happened there, all the cardboard up on the windows. Yes, I was there. I was one of the people blocked from returning back into the Detroit AV County Board, so uh, I could resume my duties as poll challenger. I was up training our next batch of poll challengers as to what they need to look out for and what we had been seeing. And uh, coincidentally, by the way, that was when they were counting the military ballots, which, um, just so you guys know, that's when they duplicate the ballots, because the military ballots come in in a format that's different from those that can be read by these tabulators. And if you don't have a Republican and a Democrat watching that, it's right for um, malfeasance, if you will, and that's exactly what happened. So along with that background, I'm actually a certified Microsoft Small Business Specialist. In addition to being that, I actually did cabling design at the International Space Station, so I, I, I have no problem working with technology. So it's kind of a unique background, and, uh, um, and just so happened that I was right there on the Detroit AV County Board on the night of the election. Uh, so. I'm going to focus in on just highlight three areas of the diagram that Colonel Waldron just showed you because uh, that's important for everybody to understand for people on the ground. These are the key pieces of technology. You talked about ImageCast Central. That's the equipment that I witnessed out at the Detroit AV Counting Board. It features a high-speed scanner and a workstation associated with it. These were networked in turn with uh, adjudicator machines, which anything that was rejected by the high-speed scanner would go over to this adjudicator machine. That was part of the absentee ballot counting suite, if you will, for 
Dominion. In addition, they had something that uh, was called local data center, where all the election officials would work from a central uh, computer workstation with a series of laptops, et cetera, that, uh, that were connected to the rest of these computers. We'll get into that in a little bit later here. But that ImageCast central area is one of the key pieces of, or key um, um, systems, if you will, that are on the ground um, for the absentee ballots in particular. If you're at an in-person polling location, you'll have the ImageCast precinct um, set up, and that's on the right-hand side of this diagram. Up on the top is kind of the local data center and the uh, kind of the um, eye in the sky, the overarching look at what's going on with the election. And uh, we'll get into that in a little bit more detail later. And as you guys know, Dominion Voting Systems was used here in Arizona, in Maricopa County, and um, they were using some of the same equipment we were just talking about in regards to ImageCast Precinct um, and also ImageCast Central that can the scanner there. So, I, I said that I was in your position before, right? So if I were in your position, these are kind of some of the key questions I would be asking in regards to all that we're hearing about this testimony regarding this election. Number one, was the chain of custody for the election artifacts broken? And thank you very much, uh, Senator-elect uh, Townsend, for bringing that up. That is a key term for everybody to understand, chain of custody. And uh, we're going to go over a little diagram on specifically where some of my comments are going to focus in on in that chain of custody. All right, and the key is to hit the right arrow. All right, and was there evidence of election fraud? There can be fraud that happens that may not even violate statute, but you know that the intent is there to defraud the election, and they take advantage of loopholes that we have in the law. For example, in Detroit, we know that there was an ability for people to vote both at the poll and uh, absentee. So some people's votes were more important than others. Was there evidence that election statutes were violated? Yeah. Uh, in Michigan, we have evidence to suggest that's exactly what happened. Was there evidence of foreign agents with the ability to manipulate the election data um, and third parties getting access to that data. We believe that uh, we've seen evidence of that as well. But um, the other thing you need to ask is, well, all right, what are we going to do about it if we see all this happening? And what options do you have as legislators? All right, so let's go to this chain of custody. And I, I, I could go into a lot more detail on this chain of custody, um, and I'll, I'll, but I'm gonna, I like to simplify it into just four key artifacts. Qualified voter file, i.e., who's registered to go off and vote in your state. Number two, poll book. That's a precinct-specific extract of the data from your qualified voter file. Um, the ballot itself, pretty important artifact, right? But then, in the spirit of the old Stalin quote, it's not he who votes that counts, it's the one who counts the vote that counts. You've got to look at the ballot tabulator and how the votes are tallied. And that was my focus um, when I went to the Detroit AB County Board. I was one of those folks that was not specifically assigned to any particular counting station. I was looking at the big picture. And we'll go over what I found here in a sec. First of all, everybody uh, hopefully has seen the idea that there's been a lot of voter uh, anomalies. This is our first clue that something's happened. When you're on the ground, you can see all the things that are happening, you know, onesie twosie style. And you say, hey, wait a minute, that, that, that envelope was backdated. Or you can see that they adjudicated something in favor of the Democrat instead of the Republican or something like that. That's easy to go off and see, but it's very difficult to see the big picture. That comes out afterwards with experts like Colonel Waldron. And in this case, we first started seeing issues when people were talking about Benford's law being violated. That's actually using criminal court cases to determine whether or not fraud existed. So that was the first indicator that some of the analyses we've seen flagged that. That's not proof. I mean, it's, a, it's getting the, the, it's telling you that it's, uh, uh, you've got something off here that you've got to investigate. Then. We've seen linear regression analyses that there's a lot of noise in, but it seemed to indicate a pattern of vote distribution that indicated some data manipulation. Then, most recently, we have actually seen folks who believe that they've identified specifically what the algorithm was, that was used to switch some of the data. Um, so, some other things that were kind of odd, and you don't see while you're necessarily on the ground, but in retrospect, you'll be able to get access to it. This is actually documented as part of the affidavit that was submitted in a lawsuit that's um, put in Michigan by Sidney Powell and, and in other states. And uh, you guys have voted quite a bit. You guys are, most of you have already served in office, right? Do you remember any of your votes being tabulated with a decimal point on the back of them? I, I don't remember any. My eight years serving in the Michigan Senate, anything, any times where I actually had a decimal point after a vote tally. 
So that would suggest that a partial person was voting? Uh, well, sometimes, you know, there are people that tried to make you feel like a partial person when you serve, but uh, no, that wasn't the case here. Um, and so you guys have probably all heard about what I call the little switch, the Antrim County. We've heard testimony on that already today and some of the things that could possibly happen. Getting into the um, possible technical app, uh, uh, reasons for that is maybe you have an internal ballot barcode switch on it where they have one barcode uh, style or, or ballot style that's flagged and then when they associate a specific scan of a vote, they flip it over to a different barcode style that may have the voters or the, uh, the candidates flipped in it. Um, something else is something called a rank, rank choice voting algorithm. It's one of the modules inside of the Dominion suite. And this is where you might see evidence of, this is the only place that I know of at least that can start putting in fractions into your vote. Because if you meet a certain vote threshold, it'll go off and switch that. Uh, it'll, it'll prioritize the votes for the second choice, if you will, and give them 10% of the first choice of, of whoever, um, of the, uh, or 10 percent or whatever number you specify, it'll actually get into the point of allocating percentages of votes to one of the candidates. Another thing is data manipulation via remote access. And another thing to look at as you guys investigate what happened here or didn't happen inside Arizona is take a look at your public accuracy tests. And there are people that, uh, this is usually in Michigan at least, it's specified what the standards are for that by the Secretary of State. And if you don't run all the possible permutations of, of votes that might happen on a given ballot, you may leave gaps that can be exploited. And I would submit, we're going to show one of the examples of where we believe um, one of those gaps is that you could uh, maybe flip a vote from a certain candidate to a write-in candidate and preload this with write-in write candidates. And we think we have evidence of that happening in Detroit. So, if you want to go off and check into this, one of the things you're going to need to do, so, yeah, yep, is look into uh, uh, compact flashcards, event logs, and paper vote tallies. So, these uh, tabulator data cards, that's where the compact, uh, that's where a lot of the election data we've been wanting to look at is going to be located, so please make sure you get your hands on that. Then we talk about the big switch. I'm not going to get any detail on this. Suffice it to say, in Michigan, you know, our current vote deficit for President Trump is being projected as 154,188 votes. Um, we got more than that that we can tie back to potential fraud. So in the state of Michigan, I know a lot of people have written us off in this context, but I tell you, Michigan's in play because of what the, the level of fraud we've seen. So here's what our Detroit AV counting board looked like. And essentially it was set up, so there's 503 precincts in the city of Detroit. They put in 134 of these image cast central stations all the way around. That's where the poll books were located. Um, and uh, there are about two to five uh, precincts per um, image cast central unit. Uh, we had five poll workers per station. Overall, I would submit there's probably less than 10 Republican workers um, at that whole night sitting at those. And, by law, we're supposed to have a Republican and a Democrat adjudicating ballots. Here's what I said that I was looking at the big picture when I got in there. I was looking at the big picture. First question I asked was uh, one of these chief election officials, uh, his name was Chris Thomas, I said, who I worked with when I was serving in the Senate. I said, uh, what, uh, how are you going to protect the chain of custody around the tallies of the individual tabulators and, and your report outs to the county and all points beyond that. So we, talk, we talked about the idea of this getting reported out to New York Times. You can see it on CNN and all that kind of stuff. Show me how that chain of custody is protected. And this election official who was a state elections director in Michigan for two decades said, I don't know. Now this is kind of an important data point, don't you think? <laughs> um, so, and I was badgering him the rest of the night. I said, you know what? Uh, he finally acquiesced and said, tell you what, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. Um, and then finally, the last statement he had on it, because I was pretty persistent, was saying, you know what, I'm not going to tell you until after tomorrow. And I go, well, you know what the primary duty of a poll challenger is to make sure that the election process are ex executed effectively and efficiently and accurately and transparent manner. He did not allow that to be done. Now, I can see physical transfer of data. I can watch when somebody moves a flash drive from a tabulator to a central station, and I can go off and verify vote counts at that handoff. I can't get inside wires to go off and trace electrons through the Ethernet cables that I saw a position. And that's the next point I want to highlight. And this is something important for you to understand here, is how these were connected. 
A lot of these election officials will swear up and down that none of these machines were connected to the internet. And that's based on propaganda being pushed by companies like Dominion Voting Systems. They will say that they have an air gap. They will say that they have firewalls in place. They have encryption in place. And I hope to demonstrate here that that doesn't mean a heck of a lot. Uh, and uh, any hacker worth their salt knows that if one computer is connected to the internet, they're all connected to the internet, firewall or not. And so here's a diagram that I put together based on, and I, this is literally midnight the next night uh, before I forgot everything. I wanted to make sure I document everything that was there. I went through and physically traced all the cables from all the tabulators and adjudicators to the local data center at the, big, at the uh, top. So it's that local data center that uh, we have election officials that did confirm that that was connected to the internet, but they said none of the tabulators or anything else were connected to the internet. I can show physical connection between those tabulator, uh, uh, tabulator machines, the ethernet cables, two routers or managed switch, it's tough to tell from 12 feet away. Um, but there, it's a router type of device connected to all the other devices on this network. And as Colonel Waldron pointed out, it's designed to work as a network. And so all these tabulators were connected to one another, all the adjudicators were connected to one another, the local data center that they acknowledged was connected to the internet were connected to these tabulators and adjudicators. So, um, and so if that wasn't enough, we went around to all the different computers and observed in the bottom right hand corner of all the computers, I can't do this because it defaults into a certain slide presentation mode, but if you have laptops that are window enabled and you're connected to the internet, you roll over that and you got a Windows 10 device, Roll your mouse cursor over in that bottom right hand corner and you'll see a LAN internet uh, a connection icon. And you roll over, it's gonna pop up and say, connected to the internet. Uh, they wouldn't do that test for me to go off and demonstrate that. Yeah. So guys, it's uh, serious stuff. And I also wanted to highlight, I took a snapshot of what the Wi-Fi connections were at that point in time. And uh, one of them is called AV underscore connect. I wonder what that was connecting. Um, part of their spec that they have in the contract with the state of Michigan that are supposed to be connected to via Ethernet cables. And they even have um, cellular-based uh, modems that they can plug into a lot of these uh, items to transfer the data over the Internet. Uh, they've got a Dominion Tech support manual that says connect it to the Ethernet. Um, there's no denying that this was network connected. And by the way, even if they say it wasn't connected to the Internet, in the Detroit AV County Board, I can trace a physical connection that says um, that the uh, system that was used to tabulate 172,000 plus votes in the state of Michigan was all networked together. So even if it wasn't some guy sitting in, a, in an ice shanty in Antarctica connected to the internet, that one guy in the city of Detroit that had access to all that information could modify the votes locally there. Senator. And so why does it matter? Well, we already talked about these man in the middle attacks. We talked about there in the Sidney Powell uh, lawsuit that's out there. There's additional exhibits that highlight that these passwords are available on the internet. And when you have a man in the middle attack, you think you're getting the right data. You think you're talking to the right person, but you ain't. You're talking to an in-between guy. Um, we also got NAIST that left the key under the mat. What do I mean by that? All the specs on what files to look for, what their file size is, everything else for the voting system is left up on the internet for everybody to go off and say, I went there myself, I could download this file, took that extract from it. You can find out everything you need to go off and manipulate as a hacker. Um, and we've got challenger observations on the ground that attest to each and every one of these. And I uh, just want to highlight one of them, the poll worker observation, that we actually, he actually observed the fact that the printout of the tape said that there were write-in candidates on it, yet when you actually, he will test in his affidavit that there were no write-in ballots submitted. Senator Colbeck, yep. we're out of time. Yep. So thank you very much for your testimony. Um, we also appreciate uh, the slide deck that you presented, and if you are willing, would you please distribute it that to uh, the members of this panel, and I'm sure um, Mayor Giuliani would like to have it as well. I will leave a comment right. for everybody. Any questions for this gentleman, Mayor? Or would you like to move on to Anna Orth? We can move on to her. All right. Thanks. Thank you very much, Senator. Um, Anna Orth, would you please come up to the uh, witness stand? I guess it's a table, not a stand. I was just <laughs> corrected. <laughs> the witness sit. <laughs> Thank you for coming, Anna. Thank you for having me. Would you please give your name and, Mayor, the floor is yours. 
My name is Anna, and I'm a resident and registered voter in Pima County. I volunteered as a poll observer. Can you get a little bit closer to the microphone, sure, please? Sure, Thank you. Uh, again, my name is Anna, and I'm a resident and uh, registered voter in, in Pima County. I volunteered as a poll observer uh, on October 16th, and then I uh, signed up to work as a uh, poll worker on November 3rd in a neighboring precinct. Would you like me to just give you an overview? Sure. Is that yes, please do. Okay. Uh, well, I, I wrote in because I was aware of some irregularities that happened while I was a poll observer and some different uh, activity that I just felt uncomfortable with on election day. So I'll go ahead and start with what happened on the day that I was an observer. Uh, I was certified prior to that to be able to watch the two people that would be correcting uh, the, the problematic ballots, which I guess are called, uh, they were duplicates. When I walked into the room, they said, I'm sorry, you're not, you can't be in here, you're going to go into the, uh, another room. So I had to walk back to the front desk. I was escorted from from that area back to the to the one area where the ballots were being um, separated from their envelope. And uh, I I was there were 30 to 32 people doing this, and there were probably 14 to 17 tables uh, that where they are sat two people and it was supposed to be a democrat and a republican but not every table had a democrat but not every table had a republican so many of those tables had uh, either a libertarian uh, or someone there was one table with someone from the green party and then there were three or four tables that had a pima county worker uh, at the at each of those tables and they worked there at the elections office because when people came in from the building they talked to them and their conversations lent, led me to believe things like oh did you leave your lunch did you bring lunch and they said no it's over at, in my office I'll, I'm gonna go get it later and she was back in five minutes so similar situation conversations that went on with people who came in with those with those workers um, I found it difficult for me to be able to uh, oversee 32 people and what they were doing. Um, I was able to catch uh, a few of the things that were uh, mistakes or uh, where ballots were just, they were un taking them out of the envelopes and putting them on uh, in a pile. And their job in this particular build, uh, room was to watch to make sure that the ballots were uh, in one direction and then they would double check the count of the ballot to the envelope to, to uh, I, I imagine, to check it against the envelopes that came in. Each table was given a bin to put these in and these bins would then go to another area where they were being stacked up to be tabulated starting on October 22nd. Many of these had mistakes or they were written in pencil. Uh, and the workers, as I went around, had questions on, you know, is this a good ballot, is this not? I was told by the gentleman that ushered me out of the place where I was supposed to be and yeah, said, you aren't to talk to anyone. You do not communicate with them. If you have an issue or you see an issue, yeah. you need to go to the supervisor, which is at the front of the table, at front of the room. So as I saw things, as I went around to each table, I would go to the uh, supervisor and I let her know, you know, they, they don't know what to do with this, pen, this ballot. It's a pencil or blah, blah, blah. And she'd say, no, it's fine. It's fine. 
So as I went back to the tables where I saw these issues, under my breath I said, you need to go tell her. You need to go talk to them about this. And so many of them said, uh, what do I do with this ballot? It's in pencil. Oh, it's fine. It'll go through. Or it was, some people wrote over their ballot, over the little oval circle where they were supposed to mark. And those were put into a pile, a separate pile that would be called duplicates. Those duplicates then went to another table and were then taken to the room where I had been ushered out of. And there was one person, there was supposed to be a second person, and I said, is there a Republican at that table? Because I said, is there a Democrat and a Republican? And he said, well, we hope so. They have to, if they get here, but it'll just be, you know, it'll just be me. Um, and hopefully a second person. So uh, as I saw these ballots along this area that, was, that they marked as dupe, which I understood to stand for duplicates that were going to be fixed, they would then be taken to the table, to the room, where I could see a glass, it was a glass wall between us, and they were taken around to the other side to be dealt with. Um, I didn't get to see that at that point. Uh, so when I left and the other person took over for me at one o'clock, I was there for five hours, uh, I shared with her, I said, there's a lot of mistakes that are happening. They're just, they're not putting them in, in the order that they need to be in. So when they get folded, they become a duplicate because they can't be counted. They're, the machine wasn't going to accept them, so it had to be then taken out of the pile and put in to a duplicate. So when I left, the man who had ushered me out of the room, the first room, uh, ha came to get me at one o'clock and walked me straight over to the front desk. And he said, I hope everything went well. And I said, well, my concern is not necessarily where I was. It was hard for me to watch 32 people by myself. But m more concerning is when these ballots were opened in the other room. And so to give you uh, kind of a sense of how it worked is the ballots, however they were collected, were brought into an initial area of the uh, Office of the Elections in Pima County. And in that room, they were then, the envelopes were then opened up and the signatures were checked. So then they would go through a double door where they were then sent to the room that I was in where there were as many people as I explained before, trying to put them in an order, not necessarily of where they were from, but how they came in. So just, let's just say there were maybe 200, 250 per box, I, I'm not sure, but they, they came from different zip codes, different areas, it was whatever was mailed in. And then those were then put aside to be counted after the 22nd. It was, my concern was the amount of ballots that were considered to be problematic that were then leaving the area that I was in, going to a room where there were only supposed to be two people, and yet not even sure there was two people. So that was my experience as an, as an observer that I shared. I thought that was concerning. Uh, the other thing is when I came back to drop off my ballot, uh, I had to drop it off outside, and there was no longer a police officer, and we found out that it was because the, our mayor, uh, or not my, I live in Oro Valley, but the um, Tucson mayor had asked, had, wasn't allowing a police officer in front of the office anymore because it was uh, uh, upsetting to people to come and vote. And so I asked the man, so my, I have to put my ballot out here, and he said, yes. So I said, how can I be sure someone isn't going to come and take this big box? And he said, no, we're, you know, we're watching it. And I said, who's you? And it was him and an elderly woman who was about 85. I, I, I don't know, and I'm sorry, meaning that she, was, she looked fragile. And I don't know how that could be protected. But I was a little concerned about that. It did make it in because when I checked my ballot, it was counted. But another question is, how, how do we know who we voted for? That's a separate issue, but my point is is that I don't know if my ballot actually has the, the people that I voted for. And um, 
you know, as I said, that's something separate from what I experienced there as an observer. As a poll worker, I was assigned to be a provisional ballot clerk. And that was on election day. And on that day, uh, I had worked the primary in August. So I had an idea of who would come by, what the issues were. Uh, but this time, we had so many more people who needed a provisional ballot than we had been allotted to have in this one precinct. So that was concerning. But the people that came to me were, I had so many people who said, I didn't ask for a mail-in ballot. My wife isn't listed as, a, as an early ballot person, but I am. And that, those are the kind of people that we had a lot of. But secondly, I had people who had just moved here from other states, and most of them were from two uh, apartment complexes. It was, it was concerning because as we counted them, we probably had over 40 people who were in one apartment complex with one address who had moved here from other states that I began to turn away a little, I'd say, I don't know, within the hour, we were so busy that I, I took a break and went outside. And a gentleman <coughs> with a yellow shirt said, um, hi, I'm, I'm, with, I'm with the Democratic Party. I'm here from California, and I'm here at this precinct specifically. I came from a Phoenix uh, in Maricopa County, a, a precinct there. And we're here to help turn uh, Arizona blue. And I don't know if just looking at me, he decided that he felt safe saying that to me. Maybe he assumed that I would be OK with that. Um, I was shocked. And, he, and I said, oh. <laughs> so what he said, oh, I said, so what is, what is your plan? What are you doing? And he said, well, I have lawyers on call to contact immediately if, you, if they don't uh, allow them to vote, people to vote. And I said, well, there was a, a cutoff date. And he said, no, every count, every vote should count. So uh, that made me nervous, of course, because I didn't know the law specifically, and I didn't want to do something that would cause a problem. So I thought, and he said, oh, I've only had to turn away, no, just a couple people were turned away, and I was able to help one person go back in. Well, that, that was probably sent to me, because I was the uh, provisional ballot clerk. So of course, th that was somebody that I had to take care of. So I went back in and thought, well, this is unusual. I, I'm concerned that somebody outside is going to be calling an attorney on something that I did because I said no. I sent somebody away and said, I'm sorry. I mean, I, if you don't have any uh, proof that you've lived here or proof of having registered, I, I, can't, I can't give you a ballot. Uh, so I called the recorder's office and explained this. And she said, well, you have to let them. All votes will count. But it's on a case-by-case -case basis. So at that point then, I had to call in to the recorder's office every at every single ballot. And you have to understand, we ran out of spaces. So I mean, I'm, I'm, we were at like 200. Uh, I'm sure you can check on this to be sure. But we were over the amount of ballots we had. But at, every time I called the recorder's office, they would ask me for their name and their, their um, birth, uh, date of birth. And when they would look that up, she, the person on the phone would say, OK, well, you can go ahead and let them vote. And so I was trying to find a constant that I could go by so that we could speed up the process. I mean, is it, is it if they've moved here and they have this, and if they've moved here at a certain date, what is it? And they would not give me any constant. They just said, you just have to call um, for every case is different. So my concern and why I wrote in was that I had two people right after having a, a slew of people who came in from other states uh, 
wanting to vote without having been registered and allowed to vote per the recorder's office, I then had someone come in from Maricopa County and one from Pinal County. It just happened right after. And each of them, when I called in, they said, nope, you're going to have to have them go back to Mar Maricopa County. And the other one will have to go back to Pinal. And I said, well, how is that that this person from Wisconsin and this person from Michigan and this person from Kentucky was able to do that? And she put me on hold for a second and then came back and said, well, it's just um, that we have their records uh, more accurately than we have for Maricopa. We just can't, we don't have, we're not able to process a Maricopa County uh, ballot. So I had to send them away. But then as they, other people were coming through, it made me question why that was happening. So I, I asked them, um, do you have information that will prove that you are a resident, that I can, I can uh, verify that you are registered to vote here? And they would pull out their card, and, and it very clearly said that they were Republican. They had a voter card. So to, to test this theory out, I called the recorder's office and asked them. And they were denied. I had to deny them. And so I was in a frenzy trying to take care of all of these people, but I found that the discrepancy between every vote counts and only those that the recorder's office would allow was indicative of how they chose who they wanted to allow to vote. And there was a consistency in the voter preference that they chose. And that concerned me because by the end of the night, which was at 8.15, after we counted all of the votes and they got put in the box and we were waiting for someone to come get them, uh, I'm in the car and the, the election was, was already counted uh, for Arizona, which I found <laughs> appalling, first of all, after working 15 and a half hours taking in votes but the experience really led me to believe that it was not, there should have been a, a system that we could have followed because I understood that registered voters ended on a certain date and you couldn't come in and vote. But I was having to allow people to vote that literally had just moved here within two weeks, three weeks. And they were all from two different not all of them, I, I take it back. There was a, a large majority, a large percentage of people who were had addresses from two apartment complexes. And the last thing is that I had a homeless man who came in with a, re, with a registration. And the reason I know he's homeless is because I said, where do you live? And he said, he didn't speak English. And he said, I don't have a home. But when I was at a, at a shelter, they registered me at the recorder's office. So when I called about it, and they said, well, he was probably registered to be in this precinct. And I said, but he doesn't live here. And they go, well, it's anybody who was registered downtown can vote. And so I found that to be odd. And last week, I, for work, I was on the other side of town, and I saw this gentleman on the <coughs> south side of Tucson with his shopping cart. Um, and I, I swung into the uh, parking space and called him and just said, hi, can I talk to you? And when he saw me, he ran off, I, you know, for who knows why. But my, my point is, is these are the kind of people that, that had apparently permission to vote in a precinct that was literally 25 miles away because they had a voting card that was given to them from downtown that it was a, a downtown precinct that allowed him to vote here. So my, my point is, is that if somebody from Pinell County and Maricopa County can't vote, how is it that in my, in this precinct, how is it that a homeless man from another area of the town and also um, people from other states were able to get permission to vote? And that was concerning to me and that's why I'm here.
Mr. Sir, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Giuliani, do you have any questions specific to this witness? Sure. Please proceed. A couple of try to just, just to give you a, a, a marker on time, it's 12.02. Okay. So you were there for 16 and a half hours, uh, Ms. Orth? On election day? Yeah. Yes. Wow. And you were supposed to uh, work with um, the ballots that were being, that were being examined? Uh, I was working with the voters, uh, the ballots of voters who were not able to walk into the precinct to vote normally on a ballot. So some of them came to me saying, it says that I got an early ballot and I never got it. Uh, others said, it says, it doesn't even say that I'm on there. Um, it says that I've already voted or I'm, I, I'm not allowed to vote here. Those were the kind of... So these were ballots that had difficulties? Yes. And there were 28 or 30 to 35 people that were looking at those ballots that you had to observe? No, that was, okay, on, on, I just described to you my experience as a poll worker right. on election day. Those 30 people that we, I mentioned earlier were, were when I was a poll observer on the 16th of October at the elections office in Pima right. County. And you were unable to see what they were doing? I. It was a room as big as almost maybe half the size of this uh, banquet room, and I was an observer watching 30... As far, as far away as we are? I could walk behind them. I could walk behind them, but I couldn't walk behind 35 people at the same time. And what so were they doing? They were taking them out of the envelope. They had already been, they had been brought in from the recorder's office where that, where the... Uh, the ballot had been opened. The envelope had been opened, and according to what I was told, the signature had already been checked in another room. But you didn't see the signature check? No, I didn't get to see that. They would take these out, and they would take Did you them. ask to see it? Yes, and I was and not allowed. And were you allowed. refused? Yes. So they said, and I wasn't allowed to talk to anybody, but I, um, as I said before, I could talk to the supervisor these people who sat at each of these tables who were representative of mostly one party with the Democrat Party and uh, they would take them out of the envelope and then put them uh, in a pile and then separate the, um, the inside envelope. In Arizona we have an outside envelope then the inside envelope right. and then the ballot, right? right? So the ballot was then collected from the bin, so each table would get an, a bin, and they would uh, separate them, put the ballots in a, in a pile, put the envelopes in, an, in, in a rubber band, put them to the side, and then mark that they had such and such amount of, of regular ballots and such and such amount of duplicates, problematic ballots, that then had to be taken to a table uh, and they would separate those, take the duplicates, mark them, put them at a table, which, which were then taken to the original room where I had been ushered out of. Not that so I was in, not in to help them. In a, a room that you were excluded from, they examined the signatures. Yes. No. They started examining the signatures, then were moved to this room. And then from this room, they were then piled to then Did be they tabulated later. Did they do a further later. examination of the signatures? No. Not in this room. The so only you, room you that observed, was done in this room. You observed no examination of signatures. And they refused to let you do that. Right. I was only allowed to watch these people put these in piles. So when I was ushered back... So how many, how many ballots do you think? Just a rough estimate. How many well, ballots? A thousand? A hundred? Two thousand? I would say each box had between 200 and 250 ballots. And I was there for five hours. And during that time that I was there, each table went through six to seven to eight, depending on how fast they were and how many mistakes they made. Because many times the, the ballots weren't, clit, weren't straight and they had to recount them or I would hear them say. So how do we, how do, we do that arithmetic? All right. Well, let's see. 250 <laughs> times eight. Somebody who's not nervous maybe can say. 2,000. That's per table. And there were about 16 to 17 tables yep. of two people doing this at the same time. So, so the, the, uh, as I best understand this, there were 2,000 ballots times 17 tables yes. that you or anyone else that you knew have got, got a chance. No Republican got a chance to observe that as far as you know. 
Well, I was the only observer allowed in at one time. So a, a gal took over for me at one o'clock when I left. And I told her, I, I'm exhausted. I don't know how you can watch all 17, but stand behind one of the tables. And, and you'll see that this particular table keeps folding them and tearing them. And once that happens, it has to become a duplicate. And when this becomes a duplicate, it goes to that table. And it goes to the room where we don't get to see what happens to that. So you can't talk to them, but you can do this and tell them, look, that's 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 folded or that's crooked or um, and I said if you see one again that has a pencil on it the supervisor is saying that yes it, she told me specifically that it could go through I mean told me that it it couldn't but told them that it could so I said there's some discrepancy in what she's telling me and what she's telling them so uh, you know just do your best to try to to keep an eye on this particular table is doing this, that particular table when I walk by is doing that, that one over there has a Pima County worker on it and she works here with them and there's no Republican at that table so it's 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 very concerning and uh, so, sure that was the, so when I was ushered out they came specifically twice to me and said uh, please don't talk to anybody and you cannot leave on your own make sure that when it's time what time do you have to leave so we can walk you out when they walked me out the gentleman said uh, I hope everything went well and I said well I'm concerned because here they were you know that my only concern is the handling of the ballots which makes them uh, ineligible to go through the machine correctly but it's the room before me and the room after me that's it's a concern i i don't get to see well, let me just a, let me ask you about that so a certain number of ballots yeah, were now put aside as duplicates yes duplicates means that they had a problem and he's had yes that they have to be yeah. duplicated right so it didn't yeah. mean there were two ballots right that's the duplicates what they can sound them. like two ballots what right. it meant was there's something wrong with it and therefore we may have to duplicate it Yes, and that's the room that I was originally. And they, and they were put aside. Put aside. And they were brought out. into another room, and you were not allowed to go in there. No, I was not allowed to go back there. So you were, you were cut off from that also. Yes, I was specifically. You were cut off from observing the problem ballots. Yes, I was specifically taken out of that room, ushered out, and brought into this room, which really was just. Yeah. The room, as I explained. And how many? How, how many could you estimate that is? Yeah, the said it was reliable. Um, each table would have an average of. Let's see. They're not. I would say maybe one sixteenth of the pile. So, you know, let's say an average of maybe ten to twenty ballots. But by the time I left, there were these bins were filled. They would fill them. They would go correct them or whatever it is that they did and brought them back best estimate um i would say my guess would be close to a in the time the day that i was there just mm -hmm. in five yeah. hours maybe uh two thousand ballots okay yeah but. and you had a sense that when there was problems with ballots or whether someone should vote or not, the choices that were being made yeah. would allow and the media's playing right along people that here. appeared to be voting for Biden and the Democrats to vote and declining those who appeared to be people who might be voting for Trump or the Republicans. Well, yes, I began to get that sense after I saw that people from other states who weren't even registered in the state of Arizona were being allowed to to vote. I was given direction that I had to give them a provisional ballot because as they walked out, there was a gentleman out there who told me he was specifically there to make sure that every vote, voter who wanted to vote could vote. And so that was on election day though mr giuliani that's not on the observant right, the day so I, I got okay it, I got it. and on that day that's that <coughs> happening and then when i would get yeah. a voter who was from another uh, county and had some indication sometimes they had a shirt that either said trump on it or they, they showed me their voter card and it 
and said uh, I, you know, did Patrick they gave me some indication that they <coughs> uh, were a Trump voter, and I had to call on them, like I did for every single person that came in to the recorder's office, and I was told to send them away. And so it was at that point that I started to see that there, this isn't, this isn't, this can't be right. This can't be right. So I tested this and, and <laughs> no, asked her. Right. And then especially as I'm I said. you recognize that. Yeah. And so when I said, they all, you all live at this apartment complex and you all live at this other one. And, and they said, well, yeah, we have to, we, you know, we're all coming in to vote. And so I, I said, well, are you a reg how long have you lived here? Are this your other precinct here? Well, I've lived here, I've lived there. And they still were allowed to vote. Uh, many of them were not residents for more than a month. Other people said they were registered in another state, but that they were here. And, and then, as I said, I think the the nail in the coffin for me was when this poor little now, oh, he's like all I, I homeless man and I speak Spanish so I spoke to him and said you know how are you here how and he said I was told to come vote I want to vote and I said okay well you know do you where do you live and he goes well I lived in a um, shelter downtown well downtown is 15 miles from where I live so there, I'm sure that's not his precinct he should be voting so, there so you thought there were about 2,000 like this roughly I would say easily just in the five hours that I was okay. there on one specific day, and that was on a Friday. They were going to be counted. They were being collected to be tabulated. One last on the question. The gentleman who said he was there to turn Arizona blue. But he yes. That was what was he? What was his official position? He had, he had a, a sign. Was he an inspector of some kind? No, he was an observe, a poll observer that was from California. It was from L.A. And in and on a break, I walked out there and and I, I said hello and just walking and he said hi, and I said what are you doing? And he said well I'm a poll observer for the Democratic Party and I'm here. I said oh, and he, as he goes the weather is hot here. It's not as hot as it is at home. And I said well where are you from? And he said I'm from California. And I said what are you doing here? And he said well I'm here specifically to help turn this precinct blue. This is one of our problem ones. And I said, oh, uh, and as I said to the panel over here, I don't know why he felt comfortable telling me that, yeah. but he said, I, and I said, you came all the way from LA? He goes, no, actually, I came from a <laughs> precinct in Maricopa where it was another one that we were, were focusing on, and now I'm here. What, what was he doing? Was he uh, campaigning? Was he encouraging people to vote for, for Biden? <laughs> What, how was was it, how, what activities did he take part in to turn Arizona blue? Well, as I understood, because I was inside working, his job was to make sure that anybody who was turned away to vote, that he would have people he could call, attorneys in, in his words. He goes, I, I have a, a couple attorneys that I'm connected to right now that if anybody's not allowed to vote, I can um, make sure mm -hmm. that they're represented. And so anybody who was not allowed to vote in that polling place, I was the one that they would be talking to. So of course, that was, <coughs> that was somewhat directed at me, <laughs> since I'm the one who would say, no, you can't vote. So I don't know what else he was doing, but he said there was a group of them that were coming in. They, they sent him there sometime after you began doing that? He was there, well, we started at 5 o'clock in the morning, just getting ready. So when I went out for, my, uh, for a break, I, it was maybe around 10 o'clock, and he had been there. Um, and they were, they, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember what he had on his shirt, but they were, they were very clear that they were, um, they had T-shirts, they said, that they matched. Another person came in to take over for him, and it was a yellow shirt with something written on the front. I, <coughs> Well, thank you very much for your service and for your courage and <coughs> testify. I just make one point, Mr. Chairman. Uh, her testimony alone, and I see no reason why she isn't telling the truth. By the way, she is under oath in the sense that she submitted an affidavit under penalties of perjury to what she just testified to. Thank you, sir. Uh, 34,000 votes unobserved 
would change the nature of the uh, election. Just her testimony. Indeed, it would. One witness. Sir, thank you very much. Yes, um, thank you. Members, the, uh, I, I, know, I know everybody wants to ask a question. I have one. We need it. I, well, everybody has one. Um, it is now 1215. I expect this hearing uh, at the rate that we're going, we will be here until late into the night. Um, please be brief with your question, and I would appreciate it if there's no follow-ups, just so that we can have a lunch break uh, and kind of set the expectation for the folks who are here and get back at it. And we'll try to make the witnesses focus a little bit more. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Leo Biasucci. I'm sorry, Representative Biasucci. You're first, and then Mr. Burley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Anna, for, for being here. Just a quick question about the, the voters that you said were coming in that were from out of town or they just moved there, whatever their reasoning was. Did they have an Arizona ID with an address or anything to show you? Were they on the voter rolls or were these? Yeah, they were not on the voter rolls. They had out-of-state driver's licenses but had a uh, either an electric bill or not or some kind of a bill that they showed me on their phone showed me that they lived in this particular precinct with that i would call the the recorder's office and you would verify through them that they were indeed legal to vote right and so then when i said well when did you move here well i moved here on such and such a date but you had to have registered I think in Arizona by the 15th and then it was extended to the 22nd or the 23rd right. so it was it was just questionable that they were still allowed to vote but sure. I had a longtime voter who wasn't allowed who to wasn't vote allowed. from another precinct right. and yet someone could vote from another state perfect thank you Senator Burling yes sir thank you uh, ma'am uh, when the, the votes that needed to be duplicated, the, the, the ones that needed to be corrected, when they went to the end of the room, did you notice anybody in there that was actually overseeing that correction, a Republican or a Democrat? No. As I mentioned before, that's the first room I went into, and he explained to me that he, this is the room where that would happen, but that um, I was not allowed to be in there. When you were in there before they sent you somewhere else, did yes. you see a Republican and a Democrat observe? No, he was only one. one and do you know how he was registered? Do you know if he's a registered Republican I, or Democrat? I, I don't know, but I have an idea, but that would be <laughs> well, well, bottom line is... We'd appreciate no speculation. Viol Thank you very much. What's well, a violation of the law anyway? Because you're supposed to have both. Right. Thank you. All right. Um, members, one question, and then we're going to break for lunch. Uh, Representative Townsend. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Anna, I just have a really quick question. Um, we had our county recorder in Maricopa County instruct voters to cross out mistakes on their ballots uh, for the number, November election, and we later had a, a judge say, no, that was likely breaking the law. You can't do that. Um, we've also heard from adjudicators saying that they had seen a full Republican ballot um, all the way down, but yet that President Trump's name was crossed out and um, the other candidates was circled in. Is it possible, in your opinion, in that other room that you weren't allowed to be in when there wasn't a second person watching the adjudication um, were there pins allowed were there were they would someone be able to cross out one candidate and vote for someone else well again i wasn't in there to be able to say this accurately but there's only an, you know can make an assumption if if a room requires two people and an observer that a person by themselves it's possible I, of course it's possible that that's what happened but those are the kind of ballots that i'd see they that because I, I was able to see them as they came through in this room there was a they were either all for um the gop or all for the democratic party but one of the president um little oval had been marked off or not marked, crossed which makes it a, a, a problematic ballot so that would have to go into the other room that you're asking me about. And again, I wasn't in there to be able to speak accurately about what this person could or could have done or didn't do. Uh, and that okay. to me was the Thank problem you. in this whole issue. I, I, I'm useless to be able to watch people just putting them in order. I, we should have had an observer watching. Um, okay. Thank you. Ballots. All right. Ms. Hart, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, here's how we're going to manage the lunch break. As you leave, please wait a minute before you walk out the door or you won't get back in. As you're walking out the door, you'll be given an armband. And in order to come back in, you'll have to show that armband. 